Good morning. Good morning, Lynn. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. <laughs> Bring a pen, Lynn. It's going to be one of those meetings, huh? <laughs> we'll go ahead and call the regular session Yuma County Board of Supervisors, also City in a that's all special taxing district, February 21, 2024, 9 a.m. Um, can we, to order, can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Alex, yes. Okay. Please join me in the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 <clears throat> we'll go ahead and move on. Call to the public. Call to the public is held for public benefit to allow individuals to address issues within the board's jurisdiction. Board members may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to Arizona Revised Statute 38 4 31.01H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, <clears throat> responding to criticism or rescheduling the matter for further discussion and decision at a future date. Public comments may be made in person or submitted by email at comments at yumacountyaz.gov. The email forms of public comment uh, will be read out loud during the Yuma County Board of supervisors meeting that starts at 9 a.m. Do we have? No, we, do not. we don't. Okay. And I do have a speaker form. <clears throat> uh, Gail Kespicone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Gail Kespicone. <clears throat> I am the neighborhood advocate for the Avenue B and C Colonia Butterfly Project. I watched the report about the band trailer park on KYMA. They said that the Yuma County Board of Supervisors say that the park has multitude code violations they have not yet remedied. The BAM Park lawyer, Mr. Claridge, said they need to collect rent in order to fix the park. He shared what the future plans for the park are. Removal of 14 trailers, even though 23 trailers are out of compliance. He hopes that they will be able to prove to the county that they are starting to take control of the situation. Arizona Family News Phoenix, residents say trailer park in Yuma is unlivable. Supervisor Reyes said they are looking for alternative ways to bring the trailer park into compliance without having to condemn it, which would displace residents who rely on low cost living. The park has terrorized our community for years. It needs to be condemned. Many of the families have already been evicted and others that are le have left out of fear for their families' lives. Once again, Ban Trailer Park is trying to manipulate the county by making promises they can't and won't keep. No family should ever have to live in squalor. I have empathy for the families that <clears throat> are having financial problems, but the ones that have moved out already have been cared for by nonprofits. My son Kenny and my daughter and I were abandoned by my first husband when, we were, when they were just babies. He sold everything we owned and all that we had was two suitcases and nowhere to go. But God always makes a way. These people in the park deserve food and shelter. After all this, it is the United States of America and we should be taking care of our own people. Our neighborhood is having its first butterfly project on Saturday, March 2nd. We will be meeting at the Duran's home, 3654 West 5th Street. They are an elderly couple that have always kept their property clean. They have tree branches that have been cut down. The volunteers will load the trailers and head to the dump from 9 to 12. There will be a pizza party at the end. We are excited to lend a helping hand to our kind neighbors. Second Chronicles 15, 7, be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. God bless you. God bless America. And don't forget, you can always volunteer in our area. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. And as you know, we are moving forward on that. Yeah. Anybody else from the public? 
I'm going to leave the call to the public open. Uh, moving on to uh, presentations, proclamations, and appointments. During this segment of the agenda, board members may discuss the presentations and proclamations and may announce appointments to the Yuma County Planning and Zoning Commission and the Yuma County Board of Adjustments. No legal actions will be taken. <coughs> Any appointments? Or? Mr. Chairman, I asked a question. I don't know that I got the answer last week with the vacancy on the library board. Whose appointment was that? In mine, and oh. I've already appointed. Okay. Perfect. Amy Shade. Okay. Okay. What the parks board? Is the parks board an individual appointment or is it a board appointment? Okay. Individual. Park no. commission board. Or park. I'm not convinced that uh, we've given you the right information on that. I, what, what I understand is that there's three county appointed positions, and I'm not sure that it is by district. Okay. All right. Here. Well, uh, mine, uh, mine was Mark, and he has moved on to um, some other boards. Correct. And so um, I asked Amy Shadle-Gill if she would be inter uh, interested, and she said yes. And so I sent that name in to Desiree. I think that would suffice if the board, uh, well, as you approve uh, that individually, it's not a board appoint we'll appointment. We'll bring forward an agenda item. Okay. So it'll be agendized at a future meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And that that's wonderful, and I would full, fully support that. I just want to clarify that that is the right information for I future will, appointments. I will make sure that uh, we get into that and get you the, the full info on that. Oh. And that's why I asked. Is, is it? Well, Mark was my end. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and uh, move on to <clears throat> item number one presentation by Arizona State Land Department <clears throat> Executive Deputy Commissioner Robin Sahid. Sahid. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you again. Nice to see I you. I was at the county supervisor's meeting. Oh, good. Well, you're going to hear about the same presentation. <laughs> That's okay. Good morning, everyone. Chairman Porches, members of the board. My name is Robin Sahid, and I'm the uh, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Arizona State Land Department. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I'm just going to give you a brief overview uh, of our department, a little background on state trust land. A lot of you are probably more familiar with state trust land than I am. I've only been in the position just shy of a year, but we'll do a little bit of background for, for the benefit of those that might not be familiar with state trust land. And then we'll talk about a little bit about uh, my vision for the, the department and some things I've been trying to implement since coming on board. So first and foremost, uh, state trust land when uh, Arizona was established as a territory and then when it became a state, uh, two sections in when it became a territory of each township were dedicated uh, for the benefit of common schools, public schools. And then when, the, when Arizona became a state in 1910, two additional sections of land were dedicated toward, for the benefit of K through 12 public education. So currently there are four sections of land that are state trust land out of every township. Um, this is just a brief background of Arizona's land ownership. Many of you may be familiar, but I like to show this graphic to show just, just the land distribution. Um, federal land, 42.1%. Native American trust land, 27.6, followed by private land of 17.6%, and state trust land of 12.7%. We currently manage, uh, back to that other slide, about 9.2 million acres of state trust land throughout the state. Um, these are just some high-level bullet points I wanted to share with you about how state trust land uh, functions, some basic rules of the road for us. Um, state land is not public land or, or permanent open space. It do, don't take that to mean you can't recreate on state trust land. You absolutely can. Uh, we sell recreation permits to allow people to do that. But the land is management for, managed for the benefit of 13 beneficiaries. And eventually that land will be put to work, whether it be development or leased for some kind of use. Um, trust lands can only be sold or leased via public auction uh, for fair market appraised value. And we cannot uh, mortgage and encumber the land in any way and put any kind of stipulations or regulations on our land unnecessarily. Uh, some significant court rulings 
Um, the state trust must be compensated at full appraised value at the time of disposition, so at the time of sale. Um, and the state legislature may not divert any state land sale or lease proceeds into our operating budget. We are a general fund department, and so all revenues go into the, the trust or to the beneficiary. So every acre of state trust land has a beneficiary, a dedicated beneficiary. Um, K through 12 public schools is our, by far our largest beneficiary, and there are 12 other institutional beneficiaries which you see represented on this slide. Uh, and this is just another, you can see all the beneficiaries there, and you can just see how large a slice of the pie goes to, to K through 12 education. <coughs> Salute. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, every dollar goes into the trust. We're a general fund agency, and we uh, value our partnerships with, with local jurisdictions uh, for planning purposes and also law enforcement. We have 9.2 million acres, and I have about five people throughout the state that can actually respond to take care of something on state trust land. We don't have an enforcement arm, let me be clear. Uh, so our, our team just goes out and can respond to things like dumping and try to work with contractors to get stuff cleaned up, but we do not have an enforcement arm. And we work with our, our local partners to, to take care or try to address any situations that might require law enforcement. So last fiscal year, uh, the state land department generated $444 million for the trust. So all our lease revenues uh, come to the state land department and those go into what's called the expendable fund and those go directly to the beneficiaries for their use they're distributed to the beneficiaries land sales or royalties uh, that are produced from our, from the lands uh, are sent to the state treasurer which is then deposited into the permanent fund and from there the state treasurer manages that fund and invests those and any royalties the earnings of interest of those investments all get distributed to beneficiaries and there's a certain um, formula that the state treasurer uses to disperse those funds so a little bit about what i've been trying to do in the past uh, 11 months so uh, I have a public service background. I worked for the city of Phoenix for a little over 15 years, uh, worked for the city of San Jose as well as the city of Santa Clara, most recently in Northern California, came back to Arizona for this position. Uh, I'm really big on customer service. That's number one for me. I am a public servant for a reason. I wanna make sure government works for the people and it is easy for people to navigate. So that's my number one. I want people to be treated as we would wanna be treated, get information they need in a clear uh, and efficient manner. So along with that, the other two fall right into that, transparency and efficiency. So I've been spending a lot of time out in communities talking to them about state trust land and how we can better partner. And a lot of what I'm hearing is we send stuff to the state land department, we never hear back, we don't know what's going on. It feels like just a black hole where information goes and, and we never know what happens. So we're trying to fix that. Um, along with transparency, we're trying to plan our land a little bit better and get those plans out into the public so they can understand what the future holds for those sections of state trust land as much as we know it at this point. Um, and we're also working on efficiencies. So our processes, some of them are long, and that's by design. There are statutes we have to follow, but there are definitely some things we can do to improve our efficiency to make sure our applications move forward in a, in a quick and, and clear manner. So those are my three big items. So those three things feed into everything I do, and every whatever we're doing trying to move forward, it has to improve one of these areas. So some recent achievements since we've been over um, we, our agency, so as, as a state agency, we have rules we need to implement. And our agency has been uh, behind the curve in implementing rules, so our rules are, are woefully out of date. So I walked into some pretty um, tight deadlines from the Governor's Regulatory Review Council, and our team has been working hard. I dedicated a team, let's put it that way, to getting these rules up to date, meeting these deadlines that we had to adhere to. Um, it's really important to me because rules are important. People need to know how, how we operate, it needs to be clear. So we're moving forward with that and we've made great progress. We're meeting our deadlines and we hope to continue to do that. Um, archeology, span when we talk about efficiency, uh, the cultural resources archeology span process is, is important and is needed for our transactions, but it can be a lengthy process. So we are working with the State Historic Preservation Office and have gone through an internal Kaizen process to identify ways we can speed this process up. So we've made a lot of headway. It's not complete yet. We're close. It'll be memorialized in an MOU with the State Parks Department. And 
we've identified a few areas um, that will help cut our application backlog in half. So we're, I'm very anxious to say the least in getting that, that process finalized so that we can move some of these applications forward. That's a big backlog for us. So this will really be helpful. Um, managing our subsurface estate. So a lot of the minerals and the mining that goes on. Uh, a lot of advancements have been made. There are new uh, projects coming into the state and we don't have adequate applications or instruments to be able to handle all of these. So we're kind of I don't want to say making stuff up as we go along, but trying to conform current what we do have to fit some of these other areas, and it's just not working for us anymore. So we are going through another process in conjunction with our, our stakeholders and, and partners to figure out how we can better streamline that process and get some new application materials out there. So we've started that work now. It continues, so we're really excited about that. The other thing I've been focusing on is interagency coordination and shared resources. So like I said, we have about 94 people on staff for 9.2 million acres. We don't have enough people to help effectively manage that land, but we're also not subject matter experts in everything. So I, I've been working with my other uh, directors, my partners in the state to figure out where we can delegate some responsibilities to other agencies. Uh, Department of, of Forestry and Fire Management is a prime example. We don't have the expertise on staff to be making recommendations about forest management or fire prevention. So we're partnering with them and strengthening our MOU to make sure that they are the ones and have the authority they need to to make decisions on state trust land. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at working with our state parks department to see what we can do to get a better handle on recreation on state trust land. So that's down the road uh, a future endeavor. There's a lot to do, but it's exciting work. Um, so current and perspective. So I'm hoping to move soon on updating our five-year plan. We don't have a five-year plan, or I should say it hasn't been updated in, in over five years. <laughs> so we want to get an idea of what people are, we want to be able to focus, right? It'll help our team focus on these are the areas we're going to try to get into production, whether it be lease or sale. So we're going to look at updating that. Um, we have several audits going on as well. We just finished a special audit on water and agriculture and our leases on state trust land. Uh, which goes right into our sunset audit. So the agency will be undergoing its sunset audit through the rest of this year and recommendations should come out next year. So we're busy with that. I put that up there because it definitely takes staff capacity. We're answering questions and making sure the auditors have the information they need. Um, we have an active budget request in with the governor's office. The governor's budget is out. Uh, a majority of ours was just um, additional staff. I don't like to just throw staff um, at an issue, but there were some key positions we knew we needed, but Along with that, we're working at how our staff is organized to see if we can create some efficiencies elsewhere. So we're, we're working on that. I already mentioned rules. Um, stakeholder and customer outreach is something I'll be doing. I'm, look, I'm hoping sometime soon, it'll be this year. Uh, I was hopeful within the first quarter, but I wanna start some kind of stakeholder meeting at our department where people can come in and just hear about some high level things going on with the department. Uh, we would publish an agenda in advance so people can decide, hey, is this something I wanna hear about or not? And then they come and just hear from our team about what's going on with the state land department. Again, that's to address what some of the feedback I've heard about it feels like a black hole, we don't know what's going on, and so we're gonna to try to address that. Um, the other thing that's big is succession planning. So about 94 people on staff on any given day. Um, there's probably a little less than 40% that are eligible to retire in the next three years. Doesn't mean everyone's gonna go, it sounds alarming, but everyone's on a different time scale just because they're eligible doesn't mean they're gonna go. But it is somewhat of an alarming number and just making sure that we have people in place uh, to, to take over um, as people leave. So we're going to work on, on planning for that. Um, just some future objectives and goals. Um, we're going to look at focusing on market ready projects in our urban footprint, just making sure we're, we're ready to go when the market's ready to go. And that falls into that five-year planning process we're going to do. Uh, we're looking at organizational improvements. Like I said, we're a small team. We're a great team, but I just want to make sure we're organized effectively to address um, all the high profile projects and the work that we do. Um, we're also going to look to improve our management of the non-urban footprint. So we have a lot of land. There's a lot going on on state land. We can't, we definitely don't have the ability to be everywhere all at once. So our team has already been looking at this, but we're going to devote some time to really looking at what we can do to better manage state trust land outside of urban areas. Um, and we're going to explore multiple use. I mean, I, I wasn't living here during um, the COVID pandemic, but I know that recreation took, was a huge uptick in people coming here to recreate really showed the need for us to figure out how we can better manage recreation on state trust land, but also 
just how we we often have multiple uses on state trust land so we need to get a better handle on that we have lessees we have grazing lessees we have recreation um we have other you know leases going on mineral exploration so we just need to get a better handle on that that ends my portion i'm going to kick it over to karen dada on my team she's going to go into um some more yuma county specific projects and then uh, i'm here for questions as well so i'll kick it over to karen quickly thank you Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, I'm going to just discuss some of our past practices. We're, we were established in 1915, so we have a lot of learning from our, our generation of agency involvement in managing state trust land. We found that um, this example on the left, creating plats of our state trust land, this is in Gila Bend, not a good idea. Um, that makes us in charge of selling individual lots and where our processes and our staff resources just don't facilitate that. The middle example is in Phoenix. This is an a entitlement project, zoning project called Paradise Ridge. You can see all of the golf course that we zoned. Not something that's really in the best interest of the beneficiary and it didn't it's not meeting the current market demand. We haven't sold any of that land yet. We're working to rezone it, and we're actually working on a drainage improvement project with the county flood control district that will remove the need for that to be a golf course that will monetize that land much better for our beneficiaries. Uh, this is pretty much at Scottsdale Road in the 101. So if you were watching the waste management open a few weeks ago, this is just north of that. So it's very highly valuable land. Um, the final example is in Pima County. You can see if we're, if we're not actively engaged with what's happening around us, we're the blue in that image. Um, the other colors represent a private um, entitlement. And you can see it doesn't really provide access to our future development. So um, as a planner, that's something that's really important for us to be engaged with our partner communities. So we have a lot that we're, we've learned from. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in front of us now. There's some, you know, opportunities we're all aware of in terms of onshoring our supply chain and being a landowner of large tracts of contiguous land that puts us in a, in a good position to sell to industries like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, which that up in Phoenix was a state land purchase. Also the LG Battery Manufacturing was a state, tr state trust land purchase. So we've been actively working with the Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, we've, we've been working to identify economic development opportunities down here in Yuma <clears throat> County as well. So again, it goes back to that availability. Are people looking for large land don't have to assemble. They have to go through our auction process, which you know we walk people through, and it's an auction. So whoever is the last paddle gets the <laughs> gets the land. But there's opportunities to um, through zoning and through development agreements to help direct the land uses to something that's going to benefit the community. Um, Availability of services and infrastructure. State trust lands often the last to develop because of some of the requirements we have. And so that benefits our, our land holdings because we have surrounding infrastructure. And specifically here in Yuma County, we have some great land that's proximate to rail, proximate to the freeways and the airports. Uh, we also have natural resources, mining, mineral estates that can help benefit some of the economic growth and development. We do have challenges, of course. Um, having the land ready with the right entitlements and infrastructure solutions, that goes back to that five-year plan. Where should we be focusing our time and energy? We have, I'm one of three planners on staff at the State Land Department. So we have a lot of land in urban areas um, that needs some attention and that needs some zoning so it can be ready to sell, sell so your community knows what to expect as that land develops. Um, and so our buyers know what they can develop. We all are familiar with the increasing costs to develop. Um, I was in an impact fee meeting yesterday um, 
talking about the cost of wastewater facilities, water availability, which is not such a problem down here, thankfully. Um, and back to availability of services and infrastructure, because we're often the last to develop, we do have large land that maybe doesn't have that TSMC project in Phoenix. That was beyond the city of Phoenix's infrastructure limit line. So we had a lot of planning to do on and working with that agency on how to bring infrastructure to serve that development. And some of the legacy hangovers I mentioned in terms of maybe we're known as a black hole agency um, or we've done some things in the past that now looking at it wasn't the right thing to do and our 94 people on staff for 9.2 million acres is a bandwidth issue as always too. Some projects we're working on in Yuma County. Um, we do have sale and lease applications. Um, most of those are solar applications. The Houdini Solar, I'm sure you're aware of, is on hold. The applicant put that on hold after the Planning and Zoning Commission meetings. Um, but we do have some other solar applications in Yuma County. We've worked with the city of San Luis. They have an application with us to purchase 20 acres for a city hall, and we actually just met with them last week. They're gonna be annexing some county islands into their community so they can better serve those. Um, we have some other annexation processes we've, or projects we're working on with the city of Somerton. Um, this was a critical piece for them to get access to their airport, which is that little strip just to the right of our, our land outlined in yellow. Um, so we're working with Somerton to get that land zoned appropriately according to their general plan and also annexed into their community. Uh, we have a meeting later today to discuss um, the needs for MCAS to acquire some mitigation land for disturbances um, in the flat tail horde and lizard habitat. Um, we're trying to engage all stakeholders in that meeting. Supervisor Simmons, I know you'll be there later today. Um, to figure out a solution that works for everyone because when you saw that map at the top of the presentation, the blue and the white, the state land and the private land, that's where our economic development future is for our state because we have a lot of federal holdings in our state that we can't develop. The blue and the white um, can develop and this is Yuma and Yuma County's opportunity for economic development. So we want to be mindful as we enter those discussions on ensuring that our land is available to meet your community needs, whatever they may be. And that's it. With that, um, Commissioner Sayhead will entertain any questions. <clears throat> Commissioner, um, I've dealt with the state land department since 1980s, the early 80s. And I tell you, it, it was a black hole. And it's going back to being a black hole. You know, the, the state land department was trusted with getting the best out of the land. And for a while there, it seemed like that's all they were trying to do, get the best price for the land. So essentially to me in San Luis, which I've been in the city of San Luis for a long time, um, we have strips of land that the state owns that they want to lease to, to businesses. Businesses don't do well with leases. So all, most of the empty land in San Luis is now state owned. And it's because state set it aside for later. Well, that was like 40 years ago. I'm not going to date myself by telling you how long ago that was, but it was about 40 years ago. I've spoken to representatives of the State Land Department within the last month, and their attitude about the land is, we'll wait until the land value go up. Well, the land value has gone up, but not because of the State Land Department setting aside land, because San Luis is developing to the east. So to me, that's a wasted opportunity to develop. Uh, they, they, meaning the State Land Department staff, need to understand the need to to sort of match the mission, you know, with the actual what's happening in the communities. Because with 93 people managing 9 million acres, it's very difficult for me to see how they can have a whole, how, how they can have enough knowledge to make a decision that's informed about what's happening in a small community, like Somerton or San Luis. Obviously, that's le better left to the local officials in that community. The conversation that I had with them about a month ago was regarding a small plot of land because the state has made it clear that they wanted affordable housing. Now I'm in affordable housing. So the, the idea was to see if they would sell a, a smaller portion of land, seven, eight acres. Well, they're now like a regular business. They, seven or eight acres doesn't appeal to them. You know, it, it, it's got to be 40 acres, 30 acres to make sense spending a year going through the process. And then it goes in a public auction and you don't know what's going to happen. Well, 
I try to make them understand, look, what we're talking about now, it's going to happen like in 2025, because it takes about 12 months, it takes longer than 12 months for anything to happen. The housing crisis is now. So we need to make sure that the message goes to the state land department, that there are certain conditions, certain times where where there needs to be some expediency, then, especially in smaller communities. And look, in, in, in uh, Maricopa County, a project the size that you mentioned, it's just a project, a small project. In a city like San Luis, a project that is 7, 8, 12 acres, 20 acres, it's a big project. It's, it's a matter of, you know, sizing them up. Um, I understand the, the trust of the state urban landscape bill because I was part of it when it was being formed. That was like a long time ago. And I understand that the, the trust has a mission that, that, that relates to providing the best solution or the best price of those lands. But there are times when certain things need to be considered, like the size, where it's at, location, those things that matter to local people. Uh, when you mentioned the, the projects, I, I noticed you had some projects in Yuma County, um, the ones in Summers and the one in San Luis, which I'm aware of. But the fact is, when you talk about affordable housing, that's a mission-driven thing. That is not a monetary issue. It's a mission driven. So they need to understand that when somebody calls with a mission driven purpose, they need to understand that even if a size isn't what makes sense in terms of money, it makes sense in terms of the community. So the message is, look, take it back to them, tell them, look, I, we understand that a big project always looks good in the books, but a small project in a small community makes a lot of sense for that community. So they need to, they need to start, take a look at that and actually react to every community a different because Maricopa County isn't the same as your county. Pima County isn't the same as Maricopa County. Every, every county and every city has different things that drive it. They, they I, I, it's so tough to tell, you know, 90 some people, whoever, the two people that are in charge of the whole area. Look, we, I understand that doing a 60 acre parcel makes a lot more sense for the state. But a seven acre parcel could mean a lot. It could be, it could mean 60, 70, 80 units of housing that can be done relatively soon if they understood that it's not all about making a profit for the for the trust. Sometimes it's about developing the state and areas that need that attention. But just a message, it will take too long to go through the whole example. Just a message is, look, when you have a small community asking for things, just remember, it's not always about making money. Sometimes it's about doing some other things for the community. Important. Any other comments? For Thank you for that comment. If I may, just very quickly, um, I was in San Luis about three weeks ago. So it must have passed in that month time frame. Uh, they invited me down. Uh, Senator Fernandez had me down to come see the community and see what they were dealing with. Um, I was blown away by the community. There's amazing things going on in San Luis, and you can definitely see the need for housing, and they've done some great things with affordable housing. So following that meeting, as Karen said, we had the team from San Luis up, and we're working with them now to see if we can annex some of that state trust land into San Luis so that development can start occurring. It became very clear to me when I was down there that the highest and best use of a lot of this land is residential. There are some sections that make sense for commercial industrial along the commercial port of entry. Um, so we'll be working with them on that. And I just want you to know that I hear you and I'm, that is my approach. So I've been out as much as my schedule allows and my, my daughter's busy soccer schedule allows, I'm out in the state traveling around meeting with communities and spending my time in smaller communities to understand how state trust land can benefit that community. I didn't know it was you. I thought it was, they, they actually told me that the state land commissioner had been yeah. in town. So it was, I, I was I'm not sure. three weeks ago. I'm not, yeah, I should yeah. plan my trip better. But I'm in Yuma no. <laughs> and I'll be back down here again soon. But I love it, but that's a great example. And that's great, important to me to get out into these communities and do that. I've done the same with Graham and Greenlee counties who also have a need for affordable housing and we're, we're gonna be meeting with them as well. So that is important to me and I can't guarantee that we can do everything all at once, but I'm at least trying to get out to these communities to understand what's going on. I have to see it for myself. I think it's really important to get there and, and see what's going on. And so then we can start working with them when they're ready to start planning some of this state trust land and as it fits into their communities. Thank you. You know, you, meant, you mentioned when you were uh, presenting, presenting earlier, the economic impact of all that land that it's gonna, you know, that, that impact that it's gonna have throughout the state. Well, like Mr. Reyes said, a small portion of, uh, of acres, it has a very uh, large economic impact on that community. So, it, it, you know, looking at that, not, not only, you know, big, big uh, parcels of land, uh, for bigger cities, but uh, in small communities, something small does make a, a very large economic impact. So thank you. 
Any anything else? Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And I, I'm here for any questions. Don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I just want people to know that we're here to help. And so, if there's ever any questions, please reach out. Thank, thank you. you. You may regret that later. No, no, no. <laughs> I'd rather people have the information than be wondering. That's mm -hmm. worse, right? So, <laughs> please. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, moving on to item number two, El Condado Informado. Bienvenidos a otro episodio del Condado Informado. ¿Dónde estamos hoy? Hoy estamos en la oficina de registros del Condado de Yuma, lo cual ofrece varios servicios bien importantes para nuestra comunidad. ¿Qué más hacen? Uno de los servicios que hacen aquí es que aquí se documenta todo histórico que ha pasado en Yuma. Si usted compró una casa en 1923, aquí está. Si acabaste de comprar una casa hace dos semanas, esperaste hasta que lo registraran aquí. Y también tenemos el Departamento de Elecciones, que tiene una responsabilidad muy grande porque las elecciones son complejas y se rigen por muchas leyes y procedimientos estatales y federales. Así es que hablando de elecciones, ¿cuántas elecciones tenemos, Carla? Las elecciones son elección primaria, elección general, elecciones de municipales y la elección de preferencia presidencial. Entonces, aquí también se encargan de capacitar a los trabajadores electorales. Ellos, ellos ayudan con todo aquello que tiene que ver con las elecciones, asegurando que el proceso marche bien y rápido. Y por fin, estamos en el Departamento de Servicios para Votantes. ¿Eso qué? Eh, ¿Aquí qué hacen, Carla? Pues aquí es donde te puedes registrar para votar. Igual y si cambias de partido, de dirección, hay muchas cosas que puedes venir a esta oficina a actualizarlos. Um, si hay cambios en tu vida pues eso es todo por hoy muchas gracias por acompañarnos y como siempre saben que pueden encontrar mucha más información en nuestra página del internet que les recordamos se puede poner en español y también quiero decirles que nos sigan en todas las redes sociales porque ahí vamos a estar poniendo muchos anuncios de todas las elecciones y de todos los procesos que se acontinan, así es que gracias y nos vemos pronto Look, I don't mind the the, uh, the, the Spanish part. I, you know, the mariachi part is a little more, a little over the top for me. Oh, no. uh, you know, just <laughs> find, find some, yeah, well, like yeah, the, the mariachi at the start, the mariachi at the end, it just kind of <laughs> takes a little bit more for me to get to. I, I you know, I, I, I want to, I want to first of all recognize the effort that Arlene and the, and the ladies are making and the chairman and the, and the administrator are making to, to sort of take into account that 63% of Yuma County is basically Spanish speaking. So, Yes, it's it's good. But the Mariachi part again <laughs> they said a little lower at the top. So I don't find the music. Look at it, boy. Yeah. So anyway, uh thanks a lot for that. It's uh, the chairman, I'd like to thank the chairman and, and everybody. So if you're making them shorter, you're making them concise. Uh, you become the stars in the uh, in the universe of uh, information here in Yuma County. So just be careful, pretty soon you'll be offered jobs at the T V station or something. So but thanks a lot. That was a good report. It's short, concise. Again, let's not mention the mariachi music again. It's, it's a little over the top, but it's okay. It's good. It's a good report. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, consent calendar. The following items listed under the consent agenda will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with uh, no separate discussion unless a board, man, a board member so requests in that event, the item will be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Mr. Chair, I'd like to go ahead. Number eight. How about the full number eight? Oh, number eight and number 13, for just the information. Make a motion that we approve. Ten. Oh, wait a minute. Ten. Ten. Eight, ten and eleven. Oh, and eleven. You're making this meeting long. Oh, no, no, Sorry. It's going to be short. It's just going to be a comment. <laughs> ten, eleven, and thirteen. Eight, ten, eleven, and thirteen. Eight, eight for me. Eight. And me. Ten, eleven, and thirteen. Ten, eleven, and thirteen? Yes. Okay. It's going to be short. I promise. Which is a promise from a politician, so should count. Okay, we have a consent uh -huh. calendar from items one to fifteen, with the exception of the exceptions of eight, ten, eleven, and thirteen. So moved. There's a motion. Second. There's a motion to approve consent calendars 
Items 1 to 15, with the exceptions of 8, 10, 11, and 13. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Number eight. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sorry for the interruption. Was Mr. Reyes, did you motion that? I motioned okay, that. Okay, thank you. And uh, John, John second. Second. And I guess. Uh, you want to go first? Well, it's, it's fine. Uh, number eight is uh, approved the, the uh, use of office work space, uh, the 325,844.59. On a, for a mobile modular management, mm -hmm. 24 by 60 building. I mean, $325,000 for me sounds like a full construction site, but I know that that's not, it doesn't apply to the county. So I just wanted to know, did you, was this something that you got <coughs> through the state purchasing contract? Is there something, it, it just seems a lot of money. It, it, that doesn't include the setup, does it? Or is it set up and everything? It does, does. Uh, Chairman Porteous, uh, Supervisor Reyes. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the requested amount includes the purchase of the building. Excuse me, the building itself is approximately $225,000. And the balance is to outfit it with a second uh, ADA single occupant restroom, a small kitchen counter, and then it includes all the costs of transporting set up on the site and uh, finishing out with stairs and ramps and, and, and all that good stuff. I should have looked at, at it deeply. I just saw the cost and I got a little thrown off. But if it includes setting it up and Includes uh, an extra kitchen, offices, you know, setting it up. That is fine. That's within the five hundred thousand dollar budget that we set aside for this. So it's not a matter of. It's a matter of finding out that he included everything for me, and, and you did because I didn't get a chance to take a look at this. Mr. Chairman, oh, you can go buy a, a, a two bedroom, two bath. What are those things called that are in the town home? Or no, not even a townhome, but the little park modular, models. huh? Park models. Park models. Here in Yuma, and have it set up for, <coughs> for less than a hundred thousand bucks. So to me, three hundred twenty-five thousand bucks is a whole lot of money for that. When, and Mr. then you could modify it for next to nothing. Mr. So, Chairman, to that point, Dave. After last meeting, we spoke briefly about getting uh, bids for a permanent site-built facility. And I was looking forward to knowing how we had proceeded with that. Chairman Porter, Supervisor Lyons, yes, we have been looking into the possibility of uh, what it might take to uh, erect a, a metal building structure on the site. It, I don't have all the information available just yet. We have some of the numbers uh, in. It does look like a comparable cost um, for an approximately, maybe even slightly larger facility um, erected, again, with a metal building shell and finished out inside. I would like to delay this until Something we have I. those prices, until we have something permanent, whether it be the middle of the building or a modified home plan like we discussed, where it could be built for $150 to $180 a square foot, you know, maxing out at 200 for any special need. Yeah. Um, and look, I, I, if it was $225,000, I know that the market is right around there. And I know building anything for the county is going to cost a lot of money because we have to meet a lot of guidelines. A lot of regulations. We say, we've been talking about doing something for emergency management, moving them, moving them into their own location for a year and a half or two years now. Now, I we set aside five hundred thousand dollars to do this. Two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars doesn't seem an unusually high amount for me for a lot, for the size of this mobile home. Now, if you want to delay it and find out if you can do it for less, let me remind everybody that you don't know that. You just get a bid. You go out and then you start getting all these change orders and all this stuff and your two hundred and fifty thousand dollar building ends up being a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar building. Now if the if Tony from Badia from uh, emergency management who's standing over there feels comfortable with this, I'd say that it doesn't matter to me. It matters more to whether the county is willing to wait. Now, time is never on our side. It's never on our side. If it takes another six months to get this thing going and done, it may go another hundred thousand dollars, and by the time you finish. It will be a three hundred and fifty thousand dollars project, no matter what. So, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have any particular um, desire to move this faster. I just wanted to move. Sometime I, I know that projects we talked about a year, two years ago, have gone up fifty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars. So I'm concerned. I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'm okay with postponing it for another month. If that's what you want. I would like to see those prices cost out for something permanent, not moved in, as we discussed with Tony. Tony. Uh, was part of that meeting, and uh, so that it's a permanent structure. Uh, mobile homes have a tendency to, to uh, fail faster than permanent. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll make a motion. Okay. Motion to postpone. 
Uh, motion to table would be okay, or a motion to continue? What would what would you what would you suggest, uh, the attorney? Uh, motion to a withdraw. Table or specific, or or just a motion to continue, which would be bring it back. If it didn't time. require publication, you can just table it to a later date to be determined. Right. We'll table it until it's ready. Okay. Yep. So the motion table, to table ready. I'll, I'll make a motion to table until ready. Uh, I'll second. Please do not take too long. <clears throat> take a month or so, but don't take another two or three months to come back. I don't anticipate it taking too much longer to gather the information. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. I second that motion. Thank you. Okay. Just, just a comment. All those Remember, in favor. Oh. Okay. Yes, Chairman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nothing's going to cut the hundred thousand. Maybe a car would cut the hundred thousand, but not a house. I didn't know you wanted to make a comment. <laughs> Just just a comment. I mean, remember we have we we set aside this money, and uh, we got to December. But well, this is not our money, is it? This is just budget money. It's it's budget budget, 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 budget money. Why are we? We why, have until so June why, to why commit did, it. <laughs> why did we have we until do? June to commit? June thirtieth. What? Why did no. we do five hundred thousand? No, you're correct. This we did set aside the board set aside the last meeting. Yeah, ARPA funds for oh, this project. That's yeah. what I thought. Well, yeah, okay. We have to commit it. But, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you know, let's not forget. Yeah. You know that, that we have, you know, certain times. So I, I think this is it needs to be sped up and you know bring us something. Relatively soon. Uh, yeah, and 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 just one thing, you know, I, I well. I'll, I'll talk to Ian after. Well, look, I, I like to finish up a comment of mine. Yeah, well, look, when you talk about building a building for the county, it takes time for it to get to the bid, through the bidding process. It takes time to get to the design phase. It takes time. It takes people. It takes. It will take at least months, not weeks, but months, to get to a, to, a, to cast out a, a, a project. And if the project is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, as long as we pay for it right before, uh, before the deadline, yeah, well, that's yeah. what I'm saying. So we need to yeah. we need so. to have this sped up and committed sometime relatively soon. Whatever it is, it won't be a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. It may be. All right, we we there's a motion and a second to uh, table item number eight for the future date. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Well, that's what they, I did or you did, man. Yeah. Um, uh, is it number 10? 10. Number 10. 10. Yeah. I, I don't like reductions in speed, but I'll ask the question anyway. This is a I try like to chairman the design the resolution time. increasing <laughs> the speed limit on 40th Street and reducing the speed limit on South Frontage Road. When I read it, it seemed like there's a, a certain amount of feet where the, the speed remains the same. Now, that's kind of difficult for people to, to adapt to that because there's a sign that says we do speed or you know speed but uh, it just uh, it, it's it, it make it would make more sense if we just simply reduce the speed all the way through all, through the street from one point to the other then it would be to go down the street and then reduce it and then go up again uh, it seems to me it's counterproductive to do that but chairman porches uh, supervisor Reyes, uh actually that portion that you're talking that is bounded by um, you know, just west of fortuna and east of fortuna that speed limit is currently 35. Everywhere else is 45. And so what we're doing is we're not changing that speed limit. That, that's going to remain 35. What we're doing is reducing the speed limit where it's 45. We're reducing it to 40. Right. I still don't like the fact that in one street, in one area, in some miles, you go up and down. I don't, I don't really, I, 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 I hate it going down, but even if it goes up, if you can be consistent about the speed limit throughout, I would like it better. It's not that I have to like it particularly, but in, in some ways, I think it's confusing a little bit to go and, and on the same street go up and down unless you go into some uh, urban areas. Uh, so I just wanted to get why you were doing that. And you're doing that because you want to be a little more consistent? Is that why? Well, the, the, the area that's currently 35 is uh, there's a lot more uh, driveways and businesses uh, accessing the south frontage road. That's why it's currently 35 uh, miles an hour. Outside of that, uh, the speed limit, like I said, increase well, is 45. And so answer? based on just the, the volume of, of vehicles on the road and, um, and crash data, mm -hmm. uh, they're recommending reducing the 45 to 40. This is also within some portion of city limit. 
So the city has already agreed to match it. That, that's correct. Oh, good. And that's you fine. have a lot more access points off South Frontage, right. especially in that area between Fortuna and Foothills. Yes. The hospital that, going that in. That's why the consultant's recommending yeah. that we leave that portion 35 as it currently is. Yeah, there's a, a lot more stop and go. Well, yes. Yeah, you're getting okay. Okay. Uh, you know, and just Mr. A is not, he's not asking that because he likes to speed. Oh, that's no. Not no. True. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Publicly, I don't do that. <laughs> he still likes me, that's just to speed, but change his speed. Is there a motion to approve? Sure. I'll make a motion. Room? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second it. There's a motion and a second to approve item number 10 as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, I'm yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking to my conviction. No, item number 11. Who, who, who opened up I number did. 11? No, it wasn't me. No, it was me. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. This is for a uh, proposal that was uh, put out on December 18th for a video visitation. Uh, phone service, mail scanning services for the Yuma County Detention Center. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. I, I just wanted to, to make it clear that this is this proposal isn't going to cost the county. No, this is a, a no-cost proposal for the, the Yuma County and for the jail district. And it, so it costs the inmates, not? Yes, so for the, the persons in the, the custody of the sheriff, they will be charged for the services. That's that's all I needed to know. Thank you. I, Thank I just you. needed that. Make a motion to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Make a motion to approve. Also. I move that we approve number eleven. I uh, second that motion. There's a motion to approve item number number eleven as and a second to to approve as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I Thank number you. 13. Thank you. I, I asked for that one. Okay. And it's like the same in 14 and 15, but I use 13. Finding that the public roads against the source state and the source state unit to subdivision prescribed were laid out, constructed, and reopened prior to June 13, 1990. And I set that into the public roads for county maintenance. Now, this has been an issue of mine since I got elected. You know, some of those county roads that we have uh, are not improved. And so it came to, to be that for, the, for us to accept them, they needed to be built. You know, they need to be in a subdivision, first and foremost. And then they needed to be accepted at a certain date. Is that date moved? Is this new date, or is it the same as the old time? Well, the exception is that they had to have been built before 1990, and they were built before 1990. So. Is that date, 1990, been different at any time before? Do you, I, will, I wouldn't be able to. I should know better than that. Uh, Frank Sketch. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, um, Supervisor Reyes, yes, that date originally started, I think it was 1975. 1975. And that's what been, I remember. It's been so, moved several times over the years. See, that's what I'm that's why I asked the question because I thought it was nineteen seventy five. So there's a lot of subdivisions in my district, Orange Grove being one of them, that were built before nineteen seventy five. Uh, that or after some of the subdivisions were built after I couldn't get them in because they were built after 1975. So if that moves to 1990, it's going to open up a lot of areas in the county that could be accepted as public, you know, as long as they're public roadways, as long as there have been subdivisions accepted or built before 1990. And I wanted to make sure I, I, I knew that. I, I didn't know that until right now when I looked at, well, until I looked at this item, that that date had moved from 75 to 90. Uh, that's my fault, but I just wanted to make sure I knew why we're having like Donovan States or why we're having the crane. Those are areas that in the past couldn't have been taken into the county uh, before, <coughs> before this law changed to make, move them up to 1990 because they weren't built before that. They were built before that, but they were built not before 1975. Mr. Chairman, um, these roads in Del Sur, um, West Crane and Donovan, these are paved roads. And they're paved roads, uh, I get it. And historically, the county has maintained these roads over the years, so this is just to legitimize our expenditures of HERF dollars. Right. Don't want anybody to get any ideas about yeah. anywhere in your district. Uh, well, the, the and, and, and all three of these subdivisions need some little help there. Okay. So well, and it's just, fine. We've been doing well, that, I think, in some of these subdivisions already. That's why I kind of take the Donovan States. I mean, I know it's been paid for a long time, and I know the county has done maintenance, but areas like gas which have been areas that are difficult to sort of place and what to do are, are areas that are difficult that will be simpler to, to, to basically formalize the maintenance that we already do on them. 
because we could. They were, they were right away. So we, okay, we have a rule that says that we cannot do this without having it be accepted in the county. That was, I thought that was the rule. So if we've been doing it, we were doing courtesy of keeping maintenance, and this makes it official. Now, the question is, okay, how many of these situations are in the, in the county, you know, how available in the county to do this? Is this the only three areas that you can do that on? So, Mr. Chairman, um, there's, I believe this is just about the last of the paved roads that are not in our system. Um, we had Alicia Avenue, I think, come in two or three years ago, and uh, Mojave Lane as well. And, uh, there, were, there were a few out there. Right. So we're not opening a can of worms where, you know, we're going to bring in a bunch of stuff. We were not. We're just making this official. We, we're doing most of this already. The cost is not going to be increased by much, if, I, if anything at all. It's just that we're making this formal instead of just being an informal sort of like a, like a courtesy maintenance type situation. It's going to become, we're accepting them. They're part of the county system now. So we're sort of not required, but we will have that obligation. We feel we have that obligation to upkeep and maintain. Is that it? Well, for us to, uh, they need to be accepted by any. But, uh, Unless it's courtesy. No, well, There's yeah. <laughs> but, but, I, but I think, I, I, you know, we, we really need to start looking at, you know, uh -huh. when I started in the county on, on this board, I ran on that, saying that we need to invest in those areas that are, that are uh, those subdivisions <laughs> that are paved. And that they, they, I know they get maintenance, but it's like maybe once every two or three years. I don't know how the maintenance schedule, but I get a lot of calls from those areas. And it, it, and so it's just, we, we have to, and it's up to us what we want to bring in. There's, there's no state law that says, you know, I, as long, I, I think it's not, it's us. We're, we're paying for it, not the state. Is, I, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, so th these roads are also mostly public roads. Um, so there's limited maintenance we can do. Uh, yeah. We can't reconstruct them or widen them or anything mm -hmm. like that. But, 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 but yeah, yeah, just kind of maintenance. You know, that's that's up to us. We can bring areas when 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 we need to. I mean, if we really want to bring in uh, certain roads into the maintenance system. Uh, Yes, yeah, sub, subject to the conditions in statute. Be careful, you know, be careful what you say. That's why I well, that's why I think we this, need to start looking at areas I that are that are subject, that says if you know, it is not an accepted right, if it's not a public right of way, if it hasn't been accepted into the county as a subdivision before a certain amount of time, you just can't pick like a road out in the middle of nowhere and say, "Well, we want to maintain maintain that legally." You can do that as a courtesy. But to accept it into the system, well, to accept them into the system, they have to meet certain guidelines. Those, these are the guidelines we're talking about. We've been doing this on a on a courtesy main situation, but now it's formal. So saying that every that we can do that, it's a little touchy dicey for me because I don't think the law has changed that much. We can only accept certain roadways that are meet a certain standard, or we can do you know courtesy maintenance. We can do courtesy maintenance on anything. We can suggest that in the middle of nowhere that there's a road in there that needs to be maintained. And I think we can ask for them. But whether we're bound by <coughs> public law to maintain them, I think that's a different story. So well, I, I love it that we could say that, that we can bring anything because it's our decision. But I don't think that applies to every road in the county. I think that there's... Yeah, but I think if you look at it, it's like Del Sur, there are paved roads. Uh, and the other subdivisions too, they're paved roads. And by not maintaining them... Oh, they are 10 times worse than just a dirt road because they're pitted, they're chug holed, there's chunks of asphalt missing out, which is tearing up people's vehicles. Emergency oh. responders, sometimes, you know, it's beating them to death as well. Trying to get bring, uh, you know, well, well, areas that are, that are, like Mr. Simmons said, you know, Supervisor Simmons, just areas that are really, you know, the residential areas that are, it, it's, and people, you know, there's a lot of homes there and the, the roads that are bad. And uh, I think we need to start maintaining those roads. And, and there's Definitely. nothing, you know. Uh, I think that precludes them from doing it, that. It's, that's the majority of the the, the the county or the complaints that I get. It's roads. And it's, you know, if, if we don't do something about it, it's just going to continue to to get worse. And, and I mean. I agree 100%. So I just don't want to, I don't want to extend this, but uh, okay. 
Everybody. I'll go ahead and make a motion that we go ahead and accept uh, item number, number 13. I'll as second that. There's a motion and, and a second to approve item number 13 as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Kelly. All right. And we promise to make this meeting quick. So everything else is going to move really smooth. Yeah, right, Tony. <laughs> Went on to discussion and action items. Uh, item number one. Uh, point Delisa Ashley Jones as the Yuma County Library District Director and authorize the county administrator to execute all necessary documents for employment. She looks like a librarian to me. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Fortress, members of the board. Jessica Rodriguez, Human Resources Director. I'm happy to stand here and represent the search committee that you appointed and to provide you with our recommendation of Delisa Ashley Jones to the library district director. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding our recommendation. Do we have any questions? Not really, but more like a comment. It is always good and nice to think that succession can happen internally, <coughs> which in this case it did, because most of these positions, they require somebody to be there in case the director isn't there. So I suppose Ashley, right, that Delisa, it's been there doing the job of the uh, director, director while yes. she was gone. So, okay. Supervisor, she's been there for four years as the deputy and been with um, the whole county for five years and has served in numerous positions for the district. Okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and make a... Well, I want to make one comment too. I'm hearing from people with at the parades and different... Bring back Booker Bear. Everybody is missing Booker Bear at the parades and different functions. <laughs> Chairman Fortis, well, yeah. members of the board, Booker Bear is currently in many things. That is why he is unable to attend the well, bring that thing where you year. get into the body and come out of the other side. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, my motion is to appoint uh, Lisa Ashley Jones as the new Yuma County Library District Director and we authorize the county administrator to execute all necessary documents for employment, which in this case means the salary and all those negotiations. Correct, yes. I'll so, second. Uh, and before we, I ask for a vote, I just want to say thank you for, you know, following that, that, like Mr. Reyes said, if we have a deputy director, you know, I think that person deserves the first <coughs> opportunity. And I've said it before, but, you know, because if, if we don't, then we shouldn't have deputy directors. All right, thank you. Um, so there's a motion and a second to approve item number one as presented. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you. Item number two, development services. Approve and authorize the chairman to sign delegation agreement number EV24-0027 between the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality and Yuma County authorizing local authorities to perform environmental inspections and permitting functions for the state. So move. Second. Uh, <laughs> just an agreement. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, George Amaya, Deputy Director for Development Services. Uh, for your consideration and action is the proposed delegation agreement between Yuma County and the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Um, mm -hmm. Another black hole. Another black hole in the state, so yeah, that's right. <laughs> Development Services has reviewed the delegation agreement and agrees to continue to performing such items, which include but not limited to um, on site wa wastewater system reviews, public water and wastewater infrastructure, public semi um, pools and public pools. Um, it also includes solid waste functions. With that being said, there is no significant differences between the existing delegation agreement and the proposed delegation agreement. Same function, same items. I don't have any much more to add regarding the, the delegation agreement. I will entertain any questions. I made a motion. There's a motion and a second to approve and authorize the chairman to sign delegation agreement number EV24-0027. Is there a, and there's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank <clears throat> you. Item number three. Thank you, George. Discussion and, and prior, prioritization of pro, proposed 
projects for the fiscal year 2024 community development block grant applications to the Arizona Department of Housing. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to declare a possible conflict of interest. I think Comité has submitted a proposal and I'm not going to participate or discuss it. So <clears throat> just in the, just to be safe, okay? So I'm just going to remain. Can you please stand outside? No. Hey, we, we got him quiet for this one. Let's just enjoy it. You mean one. you're not talking? It's going to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman, members of the board, Diana Veloz with County Administration Grants. Um, I've know, I know you've heard this a million times before. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview, uh, just to refresh your memories and hopefully um, educate some of the public that doesn't know about our Community Development Block Grant. Um, so the Community Development Block Grant, so what is CDBG? It is... Um, a program that is administered by HUD. It is a federal allocation that is given out every year by um, by HUD. There is um, entitlement um, communities and there's non-entitlement communities. We are a non-entitlement community. This, the mission of this CDBG is to provide um, the development of viable urban communities, um, decent housing, suitable living environments, and um, expand economic opportunities for prim primarily for the low income um, and moderate income people um, of your of your counties. Um, it's been in effect since 1974, um, and this program um, provides um, the allocation on um, on a formula basis to governments and states. So, with that being said, Yuma County is a non entitlement. We are, um, we get our funding from the state. So HUD gives this money to the state. Um, we get our funding from, uh, WACOG does the calculation. We share our funding with um, the other jurisdictions within Yuma County. We share our funding with Summerton, San, the city of San Luis, um, and the town of Welton. So there's four of us that share. Under a gentleman's agreement, it's 50-50. So that allocation gets, um, it gets allocated 50-50 between all of us. So every other year, Yuma County gets um, a 50%, 50 percent of the allocation. And we share it with the town of Welton. So um, this year, um, we don't know how much we're going to get yet, but we're um, basing it on what we got last year, which is around 500, 500,000. Um, so that's our regional account. So state special projects, there's three C CDBJ allocations within, um, within that the state puts out. The state special projects is um, an application that is put out every, every year, but it's competitive. But you can get up to $500,000 for that. So the state has its own strategic action plan, and their number one priority is decent affordable housing. So we have to keep that in mind when we put in an application for that state special projects because our application isn't going to rank very high if you're going to do a road project, let's, let's say, right? Um, the Colonia set aside is another competitive application as well. So that, that one, is, they put that one out every other year, um, and that's to make sure that they get as much, they, they try to, get as much money as they can within that allocation. So sometimes it's up to $2 million. So every other year, um, we can get up to $2 million for colonias. But the only thing that's the caveat to that is we can only do housing rehab with it. We can only do um, sewer and water infrastructure projects with that. Oh. So um, with that being said, um, we also have to meet one of the three national objectives. So our projects, in order for them to be eligible for CDBG, have to meet one of these national objectives. The first one is to uh, prevent or eliminate slum and blighted areas. For that um, item, we, we can do it on a spot basis, an area basis, or an urban renewal. And each one of those has different requirements that we have to meet. Um, Number two is an urgent or um, emergency community need. We have to show that we don't have any funding to pay for that emergency need. 
And sometimes we don't use that one because it takes so long to get the allocation that the emergency is over before we get the funding. So most of our projects fall in number three, the low to moderate income benefit. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, one question real quick. Could we have used any of that for the uh, BNC colonials? We, we do. We, we do? We do, we have. Ongoing, yes. As far as the mitigation, removing the trailers, et cetera? We, we can, yes. Before absolutely. it was referred to the courts, or do we have to wait till the courts make a decision? We, we can. We can do prevention, but it, like I said, it takes a while for that money to come in. So we have to do that prevention eight to nine months before. Um, if we're doing regional account, we get that allocation every every two every every other year. So it, it has it it takes time. I'm going so, on my third year, and Gail hasn't missed but one or two meetings talking about the B and C Colonia. So I just want to ask that question, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Just a, a maybe a little insight on that is that we still have to follow the process that's in place. So even if we had the funding available to go in and remove trailers, we just can't go do that because there is that process that we do need to follow. So once the courts decide we can, then we could. So for the regional account, we do have a process where we open it up to the nonprofits to put in an application, <clears throat> which means um, they it's a competitive process within <clears throat> Yuma County, within our board. Um, to go ahead and rank the projects that they bring to us that we put in as well. And there was a deadline to that, and that was, um, uh, the, the deadline was... Uh, yeah, it's already passed. Yes, the deadline passed January, um, January 12th was that deadline. So in, in, in fairness, if we bring any other projects now, um, you know, I don't know. If, if, well, we have a problem. We want to mitigate it, but I don't necessarily want to burden Yuma's taxpayers with it. If there's other federal funds that are available, then I feel like we ought to be responsible and try to pursue some of those funds. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor uh, Lines, there is a project in the BNC Colonia that Diana will be reviewing that may be of interest to you. Okay. Thank you. So some um, examples of eligible projects are public improvements, um, public facilities, rehabilitation of residential and non-residential buildings, public services, um, like you said, demolition of any blighted um, mobile homes could be, it, it would have to be a program that we would work with as well. Planning, planning and administration are just some of the examples. Some of the past projects that we've done um, and um, Fiscal year 2018, we did help some nonprofits, Catholic Community Services. We helped them rehabilitate um, 10 of their, um, of their rooms for, um, for their safe house. Um, we did some of their flooring. We did painting in there. We, um, we put some new doors in there. Um, the Orchid Street Apartments, we did some rehabilitation in there. We did some um, air conditioning replacement in there as well. Um, we did do, um, in fiscal year 2020, we did um, HVAC replacement for Comité, Las Casitas. We did um, Yuma County um, Food Bank. We did evaporative cooler replacement in that area as well. In fiscal year of 2022, we did, um, we helped Catholic Community Services save house. We're in the process of that right now, um, of um, adding two, actually two additional rooms um, in, their, um, in the second part of their warehouse, and two additional bathrooms. Um, and then we're doing um, the playground for the Yuma County um, Foothills Park. So, so just a quick timeline. Um, as you can see here, we've already held our first public hearing. That was December 7th, and that was um, the process that we have to, um, some of the requirements that the CDBG um, state makes us um, go through. So we held our first public hearing. Um, our project identification forms were due uh, January 12th. We're holding um, our priori prioritization of projects today. Um, as soon as you rank the projects and we know what projects you want to work with, we're going to start working with those nonprofits with those projects to make sure um, that we have all the details and all the paperwork and they're ready to go. Um, we're going to hold our second public hearing April 15th. Um, well, that's, that's the estimated date for us to hold that public hearing. Um, 
Applications will be due, will be due to WACOG um, May 17th, and um, hopefully ADOH, which is the state, they're going to go ahead and review them in July. Um, we hopefully will get our allocation in October. So these are some of the projects that we got seven projects that um, were turned into us, and I would like to discuss some of these projects with you all. I do have a spreadsheet printed. Would you guys like me to pass this out? I, I'm looking at it. But yeah, I'll use a spreadsheet too. Please. And then Veronica is going to be helping me with us. Story. Um, oh, <clears throat> Thank you. So a few of these projects, we have some nonprofits here that um, if you would like, they um, are going to advocate for their own projects. The first one um, is Comité de Bienestar for Las Casitas Apartments. They're asking for um, $175,000 to replace 50 um, of their HVAC system um, units in Las Casitas Apartments, and this project is part of it's like a phase two of their first phase, um, which was um, funded by CDBG, by our CDBG back in um, fiscal year of 2022. And I'd like to see if anybody, would you like to hear about the project? Or you just want me to go down the list? Okay, the second one is the Yuma County Owner Occupied Housing Rehabilitation Program. We're asking for 500,000 to real rehabilitate five homes, um, hopefully in the Colonia area. Um, Yuma County Tacna Park restroom, we're asking for 650,000 to um, put in a new ADA accessible restroom, to install a shade structure, to add basketball courts, um, put benches and upgrade the parking lot lighting. Just um, the Suda States is asking for 175,000 thousand for preliminary engineering and an environmental report in that area they um this is for this project here this area del sur is in a high income area in order for this project to be to be we for us to be able to consider this project low income we're going to have to do a survey in this area and if the people uh, in this area are 51% or lower income, then they will qualify for these funds. So <coughs> we don't know if they can qualify yet. So this one's, um, so serve if, you, if you rank it high, we will go ahead and do that research. Catholic Community Services Safe House. So we are funding them this year for the two bathrooms and um, their two um, extra rooms. This funding was also supposed to be for a community room and some HVAC. Um, we were not able to do that. The bids came in too high. We had to um, take out that extra room, the community room. It was like a meeting room that they were going to have in the, in the right next to those two rooms. We weren't able to do that. The HVAC too? And the HVAC, yes. Mm -hmm. We were not able to do that with this, this funding. So that's why they're, they're coming back to ask. Um, for the 70,000 for this fiscal year. Um, Yuma Community Foothills Park, um, it's for an all exclusive playground equipment um, for 200,000. Um, so we have a quote for um, the all exclusive playground, two pieces of equipment um, for for 200,000 that would go next to, or a ways from the, it, it's next to the playground that's already there, that's already existing there. Um, the Avenue B and C Canal Beautification Project, which is the um, project that um, uh, County Administrator Ian was mentioning right now, the, we will pave yeah. Yeah. one of the sides of the canal or the irrigation ditch that's, um, it's one of the laterals from the Westman Canal. And it would connect up to the one that's on the city? 
And it will connect to the one that <clears throat> actually that is in progress right now. I think um, uh, engineering is working on that right now. YMPO did give them funds um, from Avenue help? B to C. How, to pay how does that help us, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, mitigate some of the challenges there just by the canal in? Lighting. Just lighting? Well, It'll be lit, it will have benches, it will have trash cans, and it will have a paved, um, paved road. The more light you have, the less... I, I, I think, you know, I, 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 I've been asking, and I want to thank, you know, Ian and, and, and you, Dan, Diana, to, to, for bringing, putting this on the list, because I've been, I've been advocating for this for the longest time, <clears throat> you know, just, I, I'll say it again, but, you know, that being, see that area has been, you know, underserved for the longest, longest time, you know, by the county. Yeah. And uh, and I think, you know, after hearing, uh, when I when I represented that area, and and the very next day I heard, you know, about that area, uh, I went through there and seeing that, if we don't put in money to beautif to beautify that area, I mean, it just we it it, it just attracts unwanted people or all that crime all that bad people that that uh when they see something nice maybe they they'll they'll tend to move away or or leave arizona or yuma county at least but <laughs> well, I, I, we, we're, we're, we need to try to you know make that area better at least to start i know i understand uh two words or lines about the the issues we're having with that trailer park but uh i i think um you know starting to making that area better and light and giving it some light people will start walking on that canal path you know we have the the main one the main canal is already it's it's on it it's on on the path to get it get get a pathway there if we do this it'll solar lights and, and a pathway that people can start walking through there and people will see you know other areas or kind of look around but we we need to I think my, that's a my other comment is there are no sidewalks in there in that mm -hmm. area because it's a county and so there's not a um, place for kids to ride their bikes uh, a place for you know families to walk together and ride bikes together but but the other thing is with the abatement with the ban being in the in the court system and hopefully um, some resolution coming through the court system, this will add to that. Yeah. That's my... Well, that's... And on the, the housing rehab, can that be used for a ban? Trailer park to, once we get the okay to go in and remove some of the trailers and stuff? Um, the housing rehab, that is just for um, owner-occupied. Um, I would, I would have to go back and do some research, but I think we need to establish a program if we want to go ahead and start demoing um, mobile, home, mobile homes. We would have to establish a project for that. So that would be a little bit different than um, our owner-occupied housing rehab program. Mm -hmm. and Mr. You. Chairman, and as Ian explained, it still has to go through the process so everybody puts in their opportunity or has their opportunity to put in what their needs may be. Mm -hmm. and, and Diana, isn't that only stick built houses? Um, or No, actually our owner occupied rehab program is for mobile homes and um, for stick built, yes. Mm -hmm. But do you have to own the land? You have to own the land and you have to own the home, yes. Which? For at least two years, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the la um, so that canal beautification project is for 180,000 right now. I think that's a little bit high, um, but that's that's um, what, what our size, estimate is. What is the size of the project? Um, I think we estimated it at... How many linear feet or yards or however you want to measure it? I want to say it was about 1,200 linear feet. I don't have the exact measurement here, but I, I did put the map in there to show, yeah. but I just didn't put the measurement, but I know I put it in the application. Uh, 
Um, and the last project is a Yuma Foothills Dance and Activity Center. Um, and he was, uh, the gentleman, the nonprofit was asking for $457,495.12. This project here um, is, we tried to work with the gentleman um, to see if we could um, maybe do a senior center there instead of calling it a Foothills um, Dance Center. But um, unfortunately, he wanted it to be all exclusive for anybody to join. And um, these funds, you, you can't do that. We have to meet the requirement of either it to be an, ex an all-exclusive senior center or, um, you know, for domestic violence, vict you know, victims of domestic violence or, you know, for just children. It can't be an ex for everybody, an all ex for everybody. So um, we were not able to, um, this project was not is not eligible because of that reason. Any questions? Okay, so um, what we can do now is um, Veronica is going to help us out. We can um, go. We can start with Lynn, and she can rank her projects first, um, and um, and we can. Go down the line, if that's okay. Can I ask a question about uh, the Tacky Park? Yes, absolutely. You noted several items, and I just I've been by there a lot lately. Just wondered about usage, what the actual usage is. I know they do have basketball courts there. No, there's no basketball courts. There's not. No, what do they have. It's just two ball fields and then a ramada. Oh, the ramada. Yeah. Okay. But there's no basketball courts. You know, on some of those, um, some of the improvements, uh, the ball fields are used more than anything. Uh, you know, there, but there's no benches and there's no cover over the dugouts. I think that's, I forget what the cost on that was. I want to say 25. But little things, you know. Okay. Are you ready for mine yet? Hold on. Yeah, we're ready, Lynn. Okay. Um, the, the dance facility is not qualified. Okay. Um, my first one is E. My second one is B. My first, okay, you, uh, the BNC Colonial Beautification, Catholic Community Services Safe House. Refrigerations, units, um, replacements, A. Oh, okay. B. Three was A. Four was D. And um, and five is C. And that's it. I'm at. Determine, I uh, guess you have it. one more, which would be F, but F would be my last one. Are you ranking them all? Rank them. Yes. I thought it was just the top three. There we go. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Lyons. Okay. E, B, E is one, e is one. B is two. I took a tour after the last rehab and uh, was very much appreciative of what they've done there um, mm -hmm. and uh, and humbled by some of the circumstances that those families found themselves in and I really appreciate the work that they do over there. I agree. Uh, I would say three, it would be C, four would be F. And five would be A.
Sorry? Yes. One more. Yeah, so it would be six, yeah. Mr. Chairman? I'm going to yield to Mr. Simmons. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Simmons? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, let's see, one would be the BNC, would be number E, 2B, um, 3C, some of the projects, the smaller ones, uh, D would be 4. Uh, here. 5A and then uh, 6 would be F. So, so what we're seeing here is the total points, Mr. Chairman, um, the total points, the lower the number, that's your number one. The higher the number, that's your last one. So, okay. As the uh, ranking goes. The lower the number? The better. The higher the number. Okay. So right now we have no pressure. Yeah, oh, number one, yes. Tony? No, I think you can't can. vote. I was going to say you can't. I know. I, I know. <laughs> you can tell how. <laughs> so, do we get two votes then? I'll take two <laughs> votes. I'm going to get Tony's vote. Uh, so, I'm, I'm going to do an E, number one. B, number two. A, number three. C number four, and then F number five. That would put D number six for you. Oh. Okay, so I think, Mr. Chairman, right now we have uh, the Avenue B and C Canal Beautification Project ranked at number one. We have the um, Catholic Community Services Project ranked at number two. And we have the... Oh, no. We have the Yuma Community Technopark ranked at number three. The Yuma Community what? The Yuma, I'm sorry, the Yuma County Technopark. Um, is ranked at number three. Ooh, so Comité de Bienestar is ranked at number four. Um, El Sur Estates is ranked at number five. Um, let me ask a question. On, um, it's only three, three projects that are, that qualify. And if there's money left, let's say let's say there was three projects there that it wouldn't equal to let's say we're getting six hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, three projects wouldn't equal to choose to six hundred and fifty. What what would happen to the rest of the money? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that we would ask those three projects that we picked if there was any other projects within, if their scope could be increased, we would ask those three. Um, three applicants if their scope could be increased. Okay. We couldn't add another um, applicant to that. Um, right now, I, I just wanted to let you all know that the um, OOHR, which is our owner-occupied housing project, is under the Colonia set aside because that's the only project that um, qualifies under the Colonia set aside right now. We don't, the beautification project does not qualify because it's not a water and sewer project. It's not a housing rehab project. But um, that's the only project that qualifies under the Colonia right now, as, as the applications we got in. But um, as you see, if, if number four, let's say um, one of them falls, um, let's say the Tacna Park can't, we can't work with the Tacna Park, they can't give us the paperwork that we need, then they would drop off the list because they, they, they can't meet the requirements, we would go to number four, which is Comité. Um, right now, as it stands, I think Comité de Bienestar, we can actually apply for the state special projects for that one. We can try and apply for the, um, 
for the competitive project for that one because it ranked number four. We can try for that one. They do have to do some legwork, and that's the thing that with the regional account, they don't have to do any legwork because it's not competitive. It's just within um, the Yuma County, but with the state special projects, they require an environmental, they require extra work from the nonprofit. That's why usually nonprofits don't like to to apply for that state special projects. But I will go back to Comite and ask them if that's something that they would like to do. If that is something they would like to do, then we would um, apply for the state special projects for them. Mr. Chairman, last year, uh, USDA provided us with a list of 50 plus grants mm -hmm. that uh, were available in our area. Does the any of the uh, uh, air conditioning, HVAC replacement, apply for any of those grants that uh, uh, Representative Fernandez um, provided to us? So USDA has a limited um, population that they they can't just help. They just they can't just help. Let's say any resident in Yuma County. It has to be based on the population. And I think right now, San, the San Luis area is over that population limit for um, rehab. So um, we really have to look at the requirements of those grants. I know that they. Uh, I I understand they have money for um, <clears throat> H2A workers and agricultural workers. So you might check to see if this would qualify for any of that money for that. You know, um, la last time we were here, because, you know, for me to be ranking, um, it, 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 it's kind of, I, I just see it that, you know, it, it's, it's put on us uh, when, when we have a lot, of, a lot of projects like that. But uh, the last time we saw this, and, and, and I mentioned, you know, I would rather see the whole amount of money going to just one project that benefits several, several people, you know, a whole, whole bunch of people, not, not just certain ones, you know, certain individuals, you know, and I've talked about the, 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 the housing rehab, uh, it only benefits, you know, with this amount of money, maybe two homes. It's only two families when a sidewalk from here to Tagna can benefit, you know, thousands of people. We, we got to start looking at those. And I mean, one, one of the things that I, you know, um, obviously this is in front of us. We got to make a decision. And then I think we already did. But maybe looking at, the, at that park just... Considering that if if we were to pick the the first two and then A and because I honestly uh, I think no E um, it's probably going to be more than that. It's it's uh, I I just just the way things cost you know and and I think doing both sides of that of that ditch would probably be even better because they can go around and i mean but mr chairman just just a quick clarification i was informed that we can't do both sides of the ditch uh -huh. maybe um i'm not sure if that's accurate or oh, not. unless unless um the water users say or the water users said we couldn't do both sides that's that's what um, I was informed. Okay. Of. Well, but you know, whatever whatever's left from uh, from uh, B and, and and E, it's gonna go into that to the park, the the Tagna Park, and if it's only certain things, I would like to see maybe you know if we could hold off on that if if the board's okay on number C, and the following. Um, um, year that we get that uh, money put all that money into that park that way they can fix every, you know pretty much everything and that benefits the whole town of Tangna and people that also I know they they play a lot of baseball tournaments out there so it benefits people from Welton 
It benefits people from even from Yuma that go and play over there. Uh, but uh, that's my thought because uh, it, it would definitely make make uh, it go a longer, uh, long way to uh, improve that park instead of just you know 100,000 or 50,000 depends on what what's left. Well, are there any improvements that might be made piggybacking the grant that we gave them for the water because it's in that same area for retention or additional park or can we stretch those dollars anyway? Water retention. Mr. Chairman, um, Supervisor Lane. That is just solely for the water project. Just for the water. Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, the other thing that we can do is the reason we do the ranking this way, um, in past years, it's been um, a little bit more chaotic, I want to say, and that's why we streamlined it a little bit more. We don't have to go by this. You all can make a decision to say, I want one, two, and three, and that's it. Um, the other thing is we can move the Yuma Community, um, Yuma County Techno Park. I apologize. I've been working a lot with the Foothills Park. So the Park. We can move it to the state special projects. We can do that that one um, under the competitive grant, and we can move Comité de Bienestar to the regional. Which account. one do you think has a greater chance of success to the competitive grant? The Yuma County Techno Park. I, I mean that that's up to the board. I I just wanna I wanna see you know when we when we get the next round of uh, CDBG that it goes to one project. Uh, it, it, it goes longer. You, 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 can, you can cover more. Um, when you spread it out, especially on rehab homes, it's just not, it, it, it doesn't benefit the whole community. What if, um, I sit here looking, 180 for the, B, the uh, BNC beautification, and then 175 for the Mate and then Catholic Community Services, that totals out to about three hundred seventy-five thousand. Why are we limited to three? Um, we're we're a county, and they're limiting our our projects to three only. Um, San Luis, uh, the city of San Luis, the city of Summerton, and the town of Walton only get one project. But Yuma County is able to, um, you know. Apply for three, three. or one project. It's up to it's up to you all. I'm trying to see if we could just kind of scatter it out and some of the lower things for the park, the cheaper things get those with the extra. But if we can't do that, you know. yeah, it has to be only three. That's why. Well, all right then. I don't hear anything else. So we're going to keep it with the park and not. Um, the refrigeration well, that, that that's up. I mean, that I, I would because um, you know it's, uh, they, they'll still get something. You know, if we if we pick pick it right now, but I, I would like to see the the whole six hundred and fifty or whatever uh, you know we get next next time all of it into the park and, and just one one project less work for the for for you and your staff. Uh, and it's and it's uh, and you can focus on and, and one can, project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Darren, what do you what do you think? No, I'm I'm fine with that. I was just trying to figure out where we could put, you know, to use the funds um, to use up, you know, balance it out. But no, I'm fine with waiting till next time on, on TACNA. Well, you can these these are estimates on what it's going to cost. So there's chances that most of this will cost more than what. It's planned. Correct, Diana? Mr. Chairman, um, Supervisor Pankowski, yes, very true. That's what happened this fiscal year with Catholic Community Services. Mm -hmm. who, who applies for the Tegna Park? Is it the county? Yeah. The county applies. Okay, so, so obviously, you know, we, we can, if we wait, we, we can do things right that it's not going to, Say well, it didn't qualify because the paperwork was not. Darren's gonna make sure it does go through. <laughs> so, I would say E, A, and B, and then look at it from there. And then the competitive grant apply for the competitive grant for TACNA, and that means our staff would be doing it. Is there any additional? 
And yeah. this is a question for Catholic Community Services. Um, but we still have. Well, like like the ancient, uh, one once once they we select, and then if there's money left over, they're gonna go and say, okay, if there are any other needs or that could be put in. Well, could they use more than two rooms right now? Is my is my question. If we direct the funds that way. Oh yeah, they can. Yeah. How Sorry, many, go many, ahead. How many Come rooms would you like? Can I, can yes. Can yeah. I mean, when I was there, it was at max capacity, so and just it, want it to understand it a little bit better. Thank you so much. So, if we're asking how much or how many rooms we could use to expand more than what we've asked for, we probably could cut the group room a little smaller and then make another room, maybe like a private room for our victims that are coming in a lot do um, court virtual instead of being in the courtroom or sometimes their court proceedings are outside of the Yuma County area so we do have to use the virtual courtroom so we might be able to do something like that and have a smaller space um, instead of such a you know another big huge group room mm -hmm. a virtual a virtual a virtual so room for yeah. zoom meeting for the zoom yes Yes, that would be Court. really great. Yeah. Um, or even in the group room, we could expand the group room to have a small kitchenette so that in case we're doing hosting larger groups, having victims come in from the community, maybe where we could have, you know, some type of um, refreshments or something for them. Because um, our kitchen, um, as you've seen, um, if you've toured the shelter, is completely on the other side of that warehouse space. So we would have to be going back and forth for those things. So there, there are some opportunities where we could add to um, that and, and make it a little bit more um, friendly uh, Water. or accommodating yeah. to those that we serve. So, so there's a possibility there that it could be. So we'll, okay. we'll leave that to, up to staff when, when, when that the one that EBA. That Darren, was that a motion that you made? I'll make a motion that we approve projects E, B, and A. I'll second that motion. There's a motion and a second to approve projects A, e. e, B, and A. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion I, carries. I abstain. I abstain. Oh, he came back. Minutes, He's awake. Yeah, well, I was texting while you guys were doing I was texting about it. Thank you. And so the directive is to apply for the competitive grant, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, attack Park. Uh, I mean, we can we can still do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's it. If we get that other one too, then if we don't get that one, thank you, Diane. Diana, we would the board would like you to direct you to, since it's a county project, to to apply for the competitive grant for the Tacna facility. Yeah. She got Is that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Turner, to the right, I thank you. Moving on to. County administration, discussion and possible action related to all the county building projects to include Yuma County administration services. Good morning, Chairman Porches, Ian McGahee, uh, County Administrator, member of the board. Uh, last month, I presented a summary of total costs for our county construction projects. There were a number of increases noted over the history of some of those projects. Those increases were due to a number of factors, including challenges within the construction, industry expansion of the scope <clears throat> of those projects and um, low estimates from the outset when we were looking at the projects initially, just underestimating what the total costs were. The board was very clear uh, that you wanted to see those project budgets rolled back to fit the available funds. You gave staff 30 days to come back with a way to make those projects fit those funds and ensure that it uh, it meets the budget. And so Construction Projects Director Dave Hilland is here this morning to give you a little overview of how he met what the board was seeking to do. So with that, Mr. Hilland. Copy. Copy, copy. Yeah. Chairman Portis, members of the board, Dave Hilland, Construction Projects Director for Yuma County. Um, in an effort to uh, keep this brief, I have a presentation of approximately six slides focused on 
a proposed realignment of project budgets to fit within currently allocated funds within the county's capital facilities construction program. Before I jump into it, I do want to introduce a few individuals in the room. Should the board have any questions for these individuals related to means, methods, materials, and use, um, and their relative costs as relate to these particular projects? Uh, in the front of the room here, we have Chris Pilkington, Clint Harrington with Pilkington Construction. Of course, these two individuals are uh, part of Pil Pilkington Construction, which is the general contractor and construction manager at risk for the county's administration services building across the street under, under currently under construction, as well as the renovations to the historic courthouse up the hill. Uh, behind Clint, we have Joe Jurgen, a project executive with Mortensen Construction. Mortensen is one of the larger uh, construction firms in the country, and uh, they're Half of the design build team uh, currently engaged with the county's health department facility expansion and renovation, as well as the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Project. Uh, the other half of that firm being uh, team being Cunningham Design on the design side. Behind Joe is uh, Adam Griffin and Kevin Vandermolen with Kitchen's Kitchell CEM. The CEM branch of Kitchell, you may have heard of Kitchell Construction, it's a large construction firm as well. CEM provides construction management, project management uh, resources to organizations such as ours. We essentially are staff augmentation, helping me with the daily project management duties involved with all these projects. Uh, Adam is fairly well known here in Yuma County throughout the construction industry, and he has been researching the, the topic of metal building construction costs, in particular focused on as a possible alternative to uh, the uh, modular building for emergency management. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to address that where we're on the progress. <clears throat> so going back briefly to what was originally approved by the board uh, in 2021 going into 2022, you'll see a reference here to the capital uh, construction fund 04406. Oh, I also wanted to mention relative to that as well, we also have a number of the directors, deputy directors of all the different departments, agencies, and organizations that are uh, potentially impacted by this, this change. And also a CFO, Gil Villegas, who may have some additional information if there are any questions related to the fund. That 446 fund is, is sometimes referred to as the Main Street Building Fund. You may see that on the agenda item, and that is where these approved projects are being funded from. Going back to their origination, the board had approved these five projects, Yuma County Administration Services Building as a new construction project, the public health facility as an expansion renovation of the existing facility, the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension as a new construction, the ITS, Facilities Management and Public Fiduciary New Facility on Avenue B, and Emergency Management, a potential new facility at uh, the public works site. Recognizing what's gone on in the construction industry and the costs over time has required us to adjust our approach to these projects. Originally and up till very recently, the approach has been to attempt to move forward with the original approved priorities and scopes for these projects, recognizing the fact that in all likelihood the final project on the list would need to be deferred to a later date when, when additional funding may be identified and applied to that project. However, per the board's direction, we are now proposing a realignment of these project budgets, uh, deferring non-essential, what we refer to as non-essential components of, of project scopes and reducing overall scope across all projects. And, uh, and following the, the project priorities, uh, completing all projects and currently allocated funds within that 4406 fund. So talking about that fund over time, this is how that, that fund has evolved, how the <coughs> allocation has, has come together. Going back to July 22, that's when the, the, the approval of this happened earlier, but the, the debt financing was secured in July of 2022 in an amount of 60.03 million. Uh, the original fund, going back to the original project just some 10 years ago, uh, across the street, it had a balance of approximately 1.1 million that was carried over into this fund. Over time, again, the board recognizing the, uh, the increased costs and additional required budget to attempt to accomplish these projects. Agreed, approved, additional budget. The first one from fiscal year 23 had originally been uh, approved as about 6.7 in the original program. 
additional funds uh, added to that to bring that total to 15.8 in fiscal year 23 and another 11 million in this current fiscal year. The health district has agreed to contribute 2 million from the beginning. The interest earned category is a conservative estimate of what we anticipate will be earned over time and, and returned into the, into the program fund of 1.7 million. And then at the last board meeting, the, the board agreed to add ARPA funds, 722,000 into building design and an additional 600,000 towards the emergency management project, recognizing that these funds would offset funds uh, currently available. So we're showing that as a transfer back out of the equal amount, 1.32 million. Which brings our total program fund balance to 91.63 million. Looking at how that could be adjusted to match that total, beginning with the, the top project here, which is the Yuma County Administration Services Building. Uh, going back a month ago, the board approved the final piece uh, contract amount, being that that project is now fully designed and fully contracted. We feel it only appropriate to maintain what was presented to the board at that time of a total project budget of 54.9. That does include, again, that total amount does include $2.2 million in contingency funds. So looking down the list from there, the health department being the second priority on the list, uh, most recently anticipated to require a budget of $27 million, <coughs> excuse me, to construct the full scope. We are now suggesting a reduction of $6.5 million, bringing the new project budget to 20.5. University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Project most recently uh, proposed as a 16,000 uh, square foot facility, which would require a, uh, a, a budget of $8 million. We are suggesting a reduction of 2.5 to bring that project budget to 5.5 million. ITS and facilities, you'll know, separated from public fiduciary now. So we're, we're recommending uh, removing public fiduciary from this project. The, uh, the, the, the most recent scope with the three departments on the Avenue B site and the supporting facilities required budget would be approximately $18 million. We are suggesting with the removal, deferral, and reduction in size for this project, a, a, a reduced budget of $10.23 million. Public fiduciary, the, the direction appears to be to relocate that group to the uh, current recorder and election services building at 102 South Main Street. We're suggesting that rather than using funds from this uh, capital improvement fund that we submit any required needs to renovate or, or improve that facility through the standard budgeting process likely uh, a year from now in that next budget season. And finally, again, as, as you know, this has already been agreed to that we would be reducing the emergency management project the original 1.2 million being for a new newly constructed facility uh, as a, uh, approved back in December at the round table discussion, reducing that to $500,000 and moving forward with the modular uh, facility on the public works site. These reduced amounts bring our total to 91.63, which is again in line with what we just showed as being available in that fund. You'll notice the note at the bottom, this is, no one of course has that crystal ball, but the, the current the overall program still includes approximately five million dollars in contingency dollars across all of those projects. The anticipation is that somewhere in this range should still be available when these projects are completed, which would be returned back to this fund and be distributed however the board chooses. There is some additional information about what we potentially may be able to accomplish on each of these projects. I won't go there unless asked. And with that, I'll I'll ask if there are any questions from the board. I want to see what happens to those buildings with this new budget. What gets eliminated? Absolutely. Uh, looking briefly, and again, I would caution you at this point in time, our next step, if the, if the board approves to, agrees to move forward in this direction, the, the challenge goes back to the design team to work within this budget to deliver um, what they're able to in an attempt to meet as many of the original project objectives as possible. We'll have to reprioritize those and determine. So for example, here with this project, classic example of that scenario, I believe the county uh, public health facility. Again, the 27 million was, was constructed around the concept of an additional 22,000 square feet plus or minus 
new construction, what I'm referring to as an equivalent of 25,000 square foot at, a, at an average cost per square foot for renovation on the interior. A new uh, warehouse on the north side, which is both a warehouse and a distribution facility for uh, emergency uh, health uh, materials. The corresponding site improvements changes to the parking lot and, and sidewalks and, and exterior improvements. And then this covered service area was a, a covered area where certain uh, clinics and activities are, are conducted, such as uh, car seat fittings and that sort of thing. Uh, so with this relying scope, again, I'm suggesting this may be feasible. It needs to be vetted a little further. But I believe we would still be able to, to add, in this range, 12,000 to 15,000 square feet of new construction. Uh, we would scale back on the amount of interior renovations. The warehouse on the north side would be deferred. The north site, the uh, site improvements associated with that warehouse would be deferred, and that covered area would be deferred as well. University of Arizona Cooperative Extension, currently spec'd out or scoped out as a plus or minus 16,000 square foot new facility on the uh, county 8th or 15th Ag Center site. Reducing to 5.5, I believe this will get us in the range of plus or minus 10,000 square feet of new construction on that site. County ITS facilities management, again, um, the key factor being reducing the overall size of the facility with the removal of public fiduciary from that, that building. So originally scoped as a 22,000 square foot new facility with three departments, approximately 8,000 uh, square feet of storage warehouse space, another 1,200 of uh, maintenance shop and uh, associated tool space, uh, covered equipment parking for their, their uh, boom lift, scissor lift, and that type of equipment, and then the associated site improvements for parking, et cetera. With this reduced scope, again, removing public fiduciary, making it a two department, and reducing the footprint of each department space from what was originally scoped. Deferring those warehouses and, and exterior buildings, deferring that covered uh, equipment parking area, and minimizing the site improvements as required. Finally, as you're already aware, emergency management from uh, a stick built new construction to uh, a modular building or equal. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add <clears throat> public fiduciary, Dave mentioned that we're removing them from that project. Last week, I toured with uh, the public fiduciary and some of her staff, 102 South Main, the, where the recorders and election offices, the former Hopsetters building, and they like it. I mean, while they would prefer to be in a new building along with ITS and, and uh, facilities management in the uh, interest of shared sacrifice and keeping budgets in line, they're happy to do their part. I have a sort of a question comment type of thing here going on. When we started this process, we didn't, the only thing that's new to me, it's not anything that you brought up, it's the U of A extension building. We started off by moving them out and redoing the health department and then moving them back in. And that's what we started with. Then it became a project that was going to be done on 8th Street. But we had site location problems. So we said, okay, then, then it was decided that we'll do it on Avenue 15 and Avenue A or something. I don't have a problem with any of that. I, I just need to know the site can be done on a site that the U of A decides that they're going to relinquish because anytime we build a building that's $5.5 million, we need to build it on the county side. So that's, to me, the, the key is going to be whether the health department understands that the U of A is not coming back to the site. It's, it's having their own site built. So to me, those, uh, those arrangements that you made work out well for, for me. I mean, the new budget works out well. I, I, I like to think that everybody understands the chair sacrifice, as, as the, the administrator mentioned before. There's going to be some needed, oh, I don't even remember what the word is to take them out to, 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 to adapt to that new situation. We need to understand, we need, you know, this is $91 million worth of improvements. This is probably altogether one of the largest undertakings we have taken on the board that I can remember. So as long as the, the department heads understand what it's going to take to do this, and as long as they agree to it, I have no problem whatsoever with that. I just want to—I I just want you to know we're moving, and time is not on our side. You know, every time we take another six months to plan something, to, something it goes up. And I've been in the construction field to know that they're not going to come back to the old prices. It's going to stay high, and it's going to continue to go. 
Inflation or no inflation? I think inflation only did it faster. But the fact is that as long as I've been in construction, time is never on your side. It's never. Actually, 99% of the time it's not on your side. Every once in a while, you get one project that somehow comes out better. So whatever decision we make, we need to make the decision, stick to it, and go at it as soon as possible. Um, so everybody needs to be on board with this. I, it's not a pleasure, a pleasurable thing to do, you know, to reduce project sizes, but I think it's a needed thing to do. I need to, I, I think that the increases on, whether it was done because of construction increases, whether it was done because of planning, whether it was done because of time, we need to understand that this project only work for a certain amount of time. We're looking at a certain amount of time to get this decision made and to move. That's what I was talking about when I was talking about the emergency management system. If you see it there, it's only a $600,000, $500,000 project, it was a $1.3 million project. So when you talk about site work um, and you have to do a lot of work to, pre to prep it, it's going to take time and it's going to take uh, a lot of money committed to it. So whatever we come up with, I hope everybody understands we need to get this thing going, David. I mean, you can't, you can't, we can't make a decision and wait because if we wait any longer, some of these projects are going to get out of the range that we can afford. Them. And uh, that's what's been happening to a lot of our projects over time. Now, I understand that the increases are not within the, the uh, range of, uh, of, of inclusion in some of these situations. Uh, you know, they're not decisions made that by local contractors. They're not decisions made by the design team. <coughs> they're the, they decisions made for you by the circumstances. Circumstances, I don't look at circumstances of changing that much. So for me, it's fine. It works fine. You put everything within a budget. Everybody understands. Everybody's going to sacrifice something, either size or or something is going to be sacrificed, parking or something. But something is going to be sacrificed. And I think that that's what we as a board need to take a look and say, look, we've got to, we've got to put a, a wall here that we're not going to go through and just get it done. And every time you, you in the inside design, it's important that people understand we're going to try to get you the best building that we can at the best budget that we can. And that's going to require every one of us to make some decisions that are not going to be and I always say that in government, a decision that nobody's happy with is a good decision. This Tony, one is not going to make many people I, happy. I have a, a comment on, on the other side of that, though. This community is doing nothing but growing. We haven't seen uh, any decline in population, even though the census says it was, but we have not seen. And to me, it seems like you're building these buildings to a population that's less than what we are right now, and that they aren't going to be able to meet the needs of the people in this community the way that you guys want to cut them down. So well, yeah. I don't know where we find the extra funds, but to me, it seems like. I think it's a budget decision. Okay. And, and, I think you know, that I mean, we need to find the funds. We had an administration so. building that at the time I started with, it was 20 million bucks. It is now 50 some million bucks. We started with the health department that included there, U of A, that was 20 some million dollars. It is now combined 30 something. It, it's just, I understand that. I understand that we like to build for the future. But I think that right now the present tells us unless we come up with another 10, 13, 16 million dollars, that's what we're faced with. Those are the tough decisions that you make. That's why when they build the city hall, they call it a Taj Mahal of the city hall because they were building for the future. But look how controversial that became. I think as a board, We've been very conservative in the way we go about it. We try to give everybody something. Like I said, nobody's going to be totally happy with this. Uh, I'm, I'm not totally happy, but I think that the decision, delaying the decision, is not going to make anything, any of these things easy. We need to it, deal. What if we just did three of those projects with the amount of money that we have and then, and then do the others well, I, at I, a later date? I, I, I honestly, in Len, I think... Uh, you know, go back, go back to, to that previous slide that you had. The $96 no, million the, dollar slide. The, 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 the last one. That, uh, no. yeah. The last one you had. Before that one. That one. But you need another $16 million. No, to even okay. do Anyways. Yeah, you need $16 million. It's not that one. When you, where you had. Here's the beginning. Projects, the approach, the fund balance, the alignment, and the total. And you want the uh, project scope? Yeah. I can go into that. That one right there. Okay. But uh, go 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 to the the 
the management building, the, the emergency management. Look at that. Emergency management. Look, look, look at that. The original scope, $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do, what do we end up deciding? Well, I can tell it? you, yes. I can tell okay. you you can get well, something why? cheaper in that little modular exactly. than that. Well, but when, when, when you're talking see, when about... Get this, but hold on, Len, let me... When we start getting those numbers, and one of the things that I have always asked, Ian, is options. Give us options. And then we, we don't get them, honestly. Because if you tell me, you know, this is option A, it's going to be 1.2 million. Option B, it's going to be 700,000. And option C. Do we have to go and wait or every month see the budget and see what it is, have a meeting and bring it down, bring it down when you can, the first thing you could have done, give us three options or two options. We make a decision. Oh, we I haven't see. we haven't gotten that, honestly. It's it, all the time I think that we have spent. It's it's going back and forth. When I want to see options from now on. I I want to see them. That way we can make a clear decision and say, well, this one looks better. If we want to spend but more money on that one, we do. But we we never got we never got this. You know the 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 for the health department. It's an 8,000 square foot uh, 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 storage. And the last time that I asked you how much it was that, I think it was over $3 million for the storage building. Including uh, including the associated site uh, improvements? It wasn't just the storage, because I asked specifically, I think we in one meeting, the storage room was three over three, just a little bit over $3 million. That's a lot of money for, to spend on storage room. So th those are the kind of things that I want to see from now on. On any building that we're going to build, and I think Tony is right, we need to move on this, but if we don't get those options, some, something's wrong. I think someone should be accountable because I, I, I've asked for them several times and I don't get them, or we don't get them. We, if we, I mean, we spent almost a year on this going back and forth. <coughs> it's just not, uh, bring us something that we can decide on A, B, or C. Just kind of like the last item we were talking about in the agenda. We rank them, and, or we choose, select, and that's it. But I, I think moving <coughs> on, we need to start seeing that. Because I honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired of, you know, going back and forth on this. It's a lot of money. I know it is, but... We, we, we want to make that right decision and say, this is, I think this is what it is, or this is what we're going to select at, at far as, you know, what we have and what, what, we, what we can afford. On the, on the, on the shrinking, shrinking part of the building, you know, this is, this is Yuma County. We can't centralize, at least we can't centralize one certain building and, and, and make it grow there when we're leaving the rest of the county out of it. We need to start thinking of satellites. And I've mentioned it several times, and I brought it up. This is okay. years back. If we don't start looking on the outskirts of, of the city of Yuma, because I consider this, every building here is within the city of Yuma. It might be a county land, island, but it, it's, it's, it's still in the city of Yuma. So we need to start looking outside and expanding, bringing the services closer to the people that it, where the areas are really growing. If we want to talk about growing. Yeah, I agree. So we need to start look, thinking about that. I represent an area that it's far from the city of Yuma. So we need to start looking at that. And that's for every department that when we start, we're going to add services. We need to start looking at that, thinking about that, because I want to see options. Any other comment? Yeah, I think that we're kind of late coming up to this. Uh, and this is kind of like one of those situations where a decision needs to be made pretty soon. I, I think the option part is when you really, it's like Lynn mentioned, okay, why don't we do three and then do the other two? Uh, that's kind of like the option. 
but it's but we <laughs> I think that right now we're looking at every building, every project costing more than we initially thought. And that's because time, like I said, is not on your side. And waiting <laughs> I understand the uh, the satellite, but I think that we need to do the satellite portion, the planning uh, right now, so that we start having some options about what to, what to decide. But this is where it's at. I mean, if we want to do less projects and do more money and put in the money back into some of these projects, I'd, I'd say that the choices are pretty stark and clear. We have $91 million, what can we use them on? And most of this stuff is directed to the staff that, that's been waiting for years to get some of this stuff done. Um, and not because they, I, I mean, look at the IT people. <laughs> I mean, it's a shame to go look for them out there because you got to go to these modulars and knock on the door and they open the door. It's really sad. The story is really sad. But I've been here for 20 some years and I've seen a lot of buildings that we built. Really, out, out, the people have outgrown them. Yes. Actually, the, we moved the, uh, the, uh, the, art, the art team, we're not calling them a rat team, the art team, we're moving them from their side to this side and then we're moving them. You know, we keep moving them, but eventually we'll find them a house. But I say, look, I, I understand the frustration. I've, I've been around a long time, but I've seen these projects go really fast, really high, really fast. And so we need to, we need to do what we're doing right now. Say we cap the expense at this much. Whatever you do inside, whatever you do, reduce the square footage. That's just a budgetary issue. But it's got to, the decision has to be made relatively soon. Now, if it's possible, to what buildings we're going to build, and let's go and get them done. Um, we can talk about the satellite ones. And talk no, about I'm just saying, yeah, we need to plan. And I, and need I've been to plan. saying, but I've, I've been talking. I've, I've, You've been talking about it for a year. For a year. For a year. For a year. So, yeah. and, and, and I guarantee you there's no plan. And I guarantee you that this is going to go up if you wait any longer. So, we need to make a decision. I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm not glad because nothing of this makes me glad, but I'm really, in some ways, I'm happy that you're bringing in. You bring it in this this thing so we can just say, look, here's what we're gonna do capital this to stay within. I think you're being optimistic when you say we have gonna have some money left over at one point, something on the contingent. You you're really optimistic. I don't think I think we're going to be looking at this sometime in about a year or two and we're gonna be saying, Well, some people are gonna be saying, um, uh, wow. I made more money. <laughs> That's what they're gonna be saying. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and I agree with Lynn in that, you know, we, we some, when we're doing these buildings, we need to think about future needs. But at this particular time, I think we're just put into a situation where we, if we can just cover what they want now, it's not going to make everybody happy, especially those people who plan. And, and I understand that. I've been around long enough to see some of the plants go haywire and some of the plants work out. I think at this particular point, the toughest portion of this was to get the funding in place. We have some funding in place to do this project. <coughs> so let's decide on it and go on and do it. Any other comments? Questions? Complaints? Complaints. <laughs> no complaints. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you need a motion on the original versus current versus realigned? How do we proceed? What's needed? Yes, again, this was brought back to, uh, to fulfill the board's direction to bring projects in budget, and we would just need direction from the board to fit to go with what uh, Dave has presented to fit within the budget. Mr. Chairman, uh, when these reductions were made, how was it approached, Diana, or you? Can we hear from you? Can we hear from Russ? I mean, I, I understand what, <laughs> what Lynn is saying. However, we're at a crossroads, right, uh, Russ? And, and with all due respect, but speaking frankly, this was the first time I saw the the ten million or the ten thousand square feet, the reduction of what we had, had asked, uh, and quite frankly, that does not provide enough space for us to even continue with our existing programs and personnel. Um, if you recall, a couple months ago, I gave a presentation and, and gave you a spreadsheet of what our existing programs were, our existing personnel, and I had an estimate, I had a spreadsheet with an estimate of the square footage I thought we needed. That estimate was 16,000 square feet, and that's just to maintain my existing with no expansion. Um, since that time, I, we've been working with the design team, trying to do everything we can to figure out how we can move things, condense things, make things smaller. Um, they're proposing, I put over half of my personnel in, in common work areas, um, shared spaces, 
shared offices. We've reduced lab sizes. We've reduced, you know, everything we can that I feel like we can practically do and still operate. It came out to 15,000 square feet. So that 15 to 16,000 square feet was, I think, a very realistic number. Um, 10,000 would, would force me to cut programs and personnel. I, there's just not enough room to put everybody there. So I guess that's my, you know, and, and we've looked at other ways. We've done what we can to help, um, you know, by trying to sell the two acres, potentially could save a couple, three million dollars of having to buy property here, you know, in the city or someplace else. Um, so I, you know, we've tried to do everything we can. And that's, you know, to Lynn's point, that's not even any consideration for growth or expanded programming, which, you know, we would like to do. Um, so if I want to bring a program on, I will have to try to figure out what I can do with them. And, uh, but so that's, I guess that's the comment I would like to make is, is I really feel like that 16,000 working with the design team, we were down to 15,000 and I can live with it. I'm not happy with it. Like you said, nobody's, not everybody's going to be happy. To that point. Yeah. And I apologize for cutting you off. And how did we arrive at the 10,000? Was it arbitrary if it doesn't meet their needs? Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor uh, Lines, just to remind the board that currently the, the county provides 5,500 square feet to U of A. Um, in February of um, 2022, uh, with Mr. Engel present, they presented a request for 7,500 square feet. That then increased to 10,000. That then increased to 12,000. That then increased to 14,000. Then it increased to 16,000. So. You know, you, you see the health district uh, contributing $2 million to their project. Maybe it's time for U of A to consider con contributing to, uh, to their project. And uh, all due respect, but the, the very first time that I put an estimate on this was with that spreadsheet I presented to you. I don't know where the other estimates came from. I think the first estimate came from our existing office space, but we also had, when, when the health department was built, the uh, the, basically, the auditorium and the kitchen and all that was built for us to share with the health department. That was that was based on our need of having a place to to hold meetings and events. Um, and in the meantime, we have grown, and I have my personnel. The luxury of right now, it was a temporary luxury of of being able to house some of my people at the ag center. The ag center has asked us to move them out, so I now have to account for those. So. The very what first. Do you, what, do you, what do you estimate their square footage is that they're occupying at the ag center? Um, the spreadsheet kind of has pretty much everything on there. The the lab spaces. It, that spreadsheet that was, was shared lab space, right? What's that? That was that shared lab space, or was it just allocated for them? Just allocated for them. Okay. And so those numbers that I put in that spreadsheet were based on what they currently are using at the ag center that we need to incorporate. It's a difference between need and want. I want to I, I want to tell everybody that this is not about what everybody wants. It's what everybody needs. And now I understand. Look, we've gone from simply moving them out, waiting until we did the remodel, to now building them a building in in, in land that basically belongs to the U of A. Now, what is our responsibility as a county to provide to the U of A extension? That was my next question, Tony, for the state statute, so that we understand it clearly. Yes. It's uh, ARS 3-124C. The Board of Supervisors of each county shall provide reasonable office space for the conduct, conduct of extension work in that county. So there's also nothing there that says that we have to provide lab space, that we have to provide all this land and, and facilities. We have to provide office space, reasonable office space. That's correct. Which, which is what we were doing. It, we don't, I mean, I, I, I look, nothing, nothing. Nothing at all. The five point five point five million dollars was something I, I tend to say. Well, it's it's not what everybody wants. I said that initially, but it's what we can do for the U of A. We're doing this for the U of A. We're not doing this for the employees of the county. We're doing this for the U of A. Now the U of A should be able to say, look, it's our program. They provided us with office space and lab space and stuff. We need to put up a little bit. I mean, maybe the land, something that helps get. I, I like we like to build you. Uh, 15,000 or 20,000 foot facility, but that's what we're talking about. Nobody, nobody's actually getting what they want. So, Tony, I have a, if, if I may, real quick, just so that Russ 
can elaborate a little bit on it. It's not U of A. It's the agricultural extension, which involves WIP programs, because I've received, I will acknowledge publicly, several phone calls within the ag industry for people who support the 4-H and FFA and the other programs. So would you please elaborate on everything that you do so that everybody understands that? And please, please go back to and, and review that presentation, because I tried to do that so that you, it did outline every project, every program I have and basically the service they provide. But so our ag program, you know, I have several, several sub programs. We have the plant pathology, the plant disease program. We have a weeds program, I have a general ag program. I have a horticulture program. Um, these programs provide that, you know, that critical service to our ag industry. To our number one tier. There you in, go. In our economy. Thank you. That's which is extremely critical. Say. It's not U of A. And that's it's the point that I wanted you to make. A. It's to our number one economic ag. driver for this community. Correct. Go on. They're the ones that are paying our taxes. Go ahead. And, and so, and then the 4-H program, obviously. So the three umbrella programs are 4-H, my ag program, and then family support program. Um, so the 4-H program obviously is huge. Our family support, it kind of comes and goes. We have the dental health, pro the dental health program. We have nutrition. We have uh, positive discipline. We have uh, money management classes and stuff. So. Those are, those are things that we provide to families that they ask us to help them with, you know, in life, essentially. But, but you're right. I mean, our biggest program is the ag program, and that's where those labs are so critical, is without, you know, we've got a food safety position that is vacant right now in, in our constituents in the local, you know, ag uh, industry is really desiring to have a food safety specialist here to address those issues. Like you said, it's a, because it has been a challenge over the last few years, yes. um, and it has dra right drastically yeah. affected our community. Yeah. Can we add the ag industry to provide some of this stuff? They supplement to they the tune of what already. Right well, they they provide. It's it's different. They don't provide anything directly, directly. to cooperative extension. Right. But they give tremendously to the university. You know all the the support they give to the campus. They, they fund and support YCETA, the Yuma Center for Desert Agriculture here. Um, so they do a tremendous amount. And, you know, I guess I don't feel like it's my place to ask them to do more at this point. You know, I, I feel like they're doing, they're, they're, they support us tremendously. My challenge is making sure that we have an, a, a robust U of A agricultural extension cooperative extension because it supports our number one economy here in Yuma and that's ag and as a result Arch. all of the uh, ancillary and auxiliary uh, businesses here so and our tax dollars big maybe Mr. Chairman we can revisit that presentation uh, or set aside a work session and so that please invite yeah I'll, I'll come give the presentation again uh, update it go through it uh, further explain any questions you have. It was the military. So the, the no, I know, military. but so this is this is a direct responsibility that we have. I don't have a problem with extension. It's just that it's called the U of A extension for a reason. And statutorily, like we're only required to provide office space. We're not required to work with. I mean, look, nothing that we're doing for the U of A or the agriculture extension, it's required by the statute. We're doing it because we want to, and everybody's cutting sides now. No, it is a statute. It's a statute, and it's cooperative extension. It, it is designed and meant to be a partnership between federal, state, and county. Where is the federal and the state in this? The, the state provides our budget to operate the through program. the federal, yeah. So all of our, you know, all of our millions of dollars, and, and that's the other thing I pointed out in the, in the, um, presentation I gave is, you know, our programs bring in one program alone, the ag program, the irrigation efficiency program was $45 million, and the majority of that came here. You're not, Russ, you're not going to get an argument from me regarding the importance of the ag extension or the importance of agriculture in the county or the importance. You're going to get arguments from me regarding the budget. It, you know, everybody is making uh, sacrifices. I understand that you, look, when I started with this project, personally, I didn't start with the U of A extension. It got into this project along the way. But I'm not against doing this with the U of A. I just, everybody's cutting there. Maybe it's just a bigger cut on your side. But like Ian said, we started with moving you out while we remodeled and getting you back in. 
And no, then he started, then, then it was a building on Avenue 8. I said that already. Mr. Chairman, as long as you well, give him that many I know we can debate this all day long, but what I'd like to do is to propose that we approve the current budget estimate with the ability to revisit it after we've had the opportunity to sit down to see how we can work together to mitigate some of the challenges. I, I, I'm agreeing with that. I, I, like I said, there's no problem with me thinking that the U of A needs 15,000. There's a motion on session. Okay, there's a second. To take the change. Current to make budget. Those Current budget. And then, and then we, we, look in, we revisit the U of A station. I, I, oh, I, uh, I, the, the U of A. Diana, this doesn't, Sorry, this, Diana. this doesn't take anything away from you right now, but it does give us the ability to proceed forward and then come back and dissect what we might do. But Diana's, but the health department needs. It's not a cut. It's the current current budget estimate okay. in the center in the center. It's, it was twenty seven to twenty. It's still twenty seven, Diana. It's the current budget estimate. Yes, you're approving the current budget estimate, and then we can go back and look at. But that was already done. So no. the purpose of this meeting was to see what we could get in between that. We're sixteen million dollars short as it is. That other. But we can continue, and then we can come back and take these individually, Tony. We can sit down with U of A. We can sit down with ITS. Oh, we can do that anyway. I we, just can we can also we can also take our last tour of the buildings, and maybe we assess how we improve that. How we improve on that? We will have this building coming up, which will also be available, and we can reassess. But then, because I second the motion, then let me ask the IT people. The health department people, if they're okay with the requested budget or if they have a problem with it. Because I think the only issue that we have left is the U of A corporate extension and how much money we're going to spend on it. The rest of the stuff, everybody gets cut. Everybody's getting cut. So the question that I have is how do you feel about that? I mean, I feel other than bad. I mean, is there, is, you, can you live with that? I, I think we, we all went through that. You know, we, we had the privilege and I'm really grateful that we had the opportunity to meet with the architecture firm and we conducted needs assessments uh, several years ago, and the resulting proposal was um, a combination of safety and serve, you know, safety and service enhancements to the building. Now, the budget, you know, I, I see the budget. I understand the reason for that. And you talked about collective sacrifice. You know, we are resilient in in public health, and so right now, you know, I can't speak, and I, I don't want to just. I don't want to put a project above another or whatever. And I, I don't, certainly I'm listening to the ag conversation. And our contribution to ag is very different. You know, we don't do, we, we don't do research. I understand the importance. I just did a presentation where I highlighted the value of our agricultural community. And actually we were being recognized because the people we serve are the people that are working in the agricultural fields. Mm -hmm. And we talked about not having space and not having satellite buildings, but going out at four in the morning and vaccinating those people and working with the different growers and making sure, for example, during COVID, that if they couldn't get their first shot, we coordinated with an agency so their FQHC could do that because somebody needs to harvest the crops because it's, it is our leading, very proud of that, very proud to echo that fact. So um, that's, that's our ag contribution and we do. We're an academic health department, so we conduct research and our research is geared more towards health outcomes and outreach and you may actually are our academic partner, our first partnership was U of A. And we do grants and it's, it's not with the extension, again, because there's several branches. So it's with the medical school and the public health school. Um, and so those were things, cutting back on those again goes to the collective sacrifice. I will not cut services. We will figure it out and I'm very proud to stand before you telling you that at least definitely, and I could look at our finance department, that during our, you know, our, our tenure working together, we have expanded services, implemented new services, all with as much as possible grant funding at no cost to taxpayers. And that was why we were able to contribute $2 million to the project. That was our mission then. That is our mission now. And again, um, yeah, do I? those things weren't things I wanted. Those were things we felt we needed. But again, you know, we have lots of other county departments that are also waiting, you know, for because they're, they're doing what they can with what they have. I respect that, I understand the need for, for the project, so definitely if you need me to provide more input, but again, um, I understand the cost and I understand why they're happening. And if there was a grant 
um, that played for infrastructure, I would have been on it a long time ago. But things like ARPA funds are really rare um, and very unique and one-time things. So, um, but we have already been on it. And again, I, I could sit here and I could, we could go around and around, but I, I don't think it serves um, the public interest. We will continue with our mission and we will figure it out. And yeah, I mean the proposal, but I just want to clarify that those were needs not wants. I can't imagine how expensive it would have been if we would have just focused on the wants. But again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to stand up here. Thank you. Dan. Those are neat. Cliff. That's exactly what she said. Mr. Chairman. Cliff. Oh, good morning, Chairman, members of the board. Cliff Summers, Chief Information Officer for Yuma County. Um, this is the first that we've heard that um, public fiduciary was not going to be with us in the, in the building with us as another tenant. So as far as space for actual team members, it may be adequate. But one concern that we definitely have is the lack of having some kind of warehouse there in order to house any of the equipment that we bring in. Those issues create a problem. And you have to realize that we're internal services just like facilities management. So everything that everyone operates off of is tied back to what we're providing so you can provide services back to the citizens. Tom, you know, the only... Um, so that square like, footage... The only solution that I see to going back to what Lynn has said is to go out to, to, to the voters and say we need seventeen million dollars more to make I'm everybody not to raise taxes. taxes. Well that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean the money's gotta come from somewhere. I mean it's either gotta come from cuts or it's gotta come from our budget. And our budget doesn't deal with sixteen million dollars being short. Our budget is supposed to be a flat budget, it's supposed to provide for everything. That is not a flat budget. You know that is supervisor Reyes, let me you know that 91, you know, we, we asked for, for a cut, you know, I'm, and, and, and I wish we could give everybody what they want. I mean, the building from here to San Luis, is that what everybody needs? If we could do that. But when I start looking at numbers, just hear me out. The U of A extension, it was what, uh, 1,600 1, or 16,000 square foot building for eight, $8 million. The health department for new, new square footage, it was 12,000. And we're gonna pay 27 million. That's what I look at. It's just I say why 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 is why that the disparity? Yes, I mean it's it's just and I know some things for health department it's it's more expensive, but the building should be the material shouldn't be square footed. I mean it, it's it's just to me when I you know I go back to the options and if I mean if we tell someone oh I got thirty million dollars build me something they're gonna build you of course they're gonna try to max whatever they can to to get. Their their profit is, is that that's what I look at. That's what I look at the number the, the 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 cost. And like and I'll go back that warehouse three million dollars. I call it a warehouse and it's for storage. I don't care what you're gonna what you say it is, but it's it's it, on the paper I side it was a storage. And we're gonna pay over three million dollars for for a building that we're gonna be using as storage. That's those those are the things that I kind of that I look at. Dave, I have and a question. And if we don't start that. looking at those, yeah. and we make a decision, how based much on did that, the other one cost? It's just that's why the the cost it, it goes up tremendously. I did just want to mention, if I could quickly, Chairman Porches, that the the number you mentioned for the health district it also includes significant remodel of existing square footage to increase efficiencies and better usage of that interior. Square you know, and, and and that's one of the things that, I mean, I didn't, you, you brought it up, but I didn't want to get into it. Why can't we leave that building alone? Because they're going to get over 5,000 with 5,000 square feet, uh, right, you know, more space. With? with By the U, uh, extension leaving now, leaving there. So why do we have to re do a whole bunch? Because that's where the majority of the cost is. If you, if, me, if you, if you me. put that... Because when you give me an answer, when I ask why, and they and, and you give me an answer, better circulation, you think I'm, you think that goes out for, to the taxpayers that it for better circulation when I can't 
I, I mean, I want to make sure that I want to go to your office and you're right there and just mm -hmm. open the door here and go instead of opening that door and go around. To me, that just not goes good with the taxpayers. When you say better circulation, that doesn't go, that doesn't go good with me because that's money that we're going to be spending. Or just members of the board, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to go as much detail as you like. I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, just as a reminder, the health department approach went through a number of stages of assessment, feasibility studies, conceptual planning, and so on. All those were brought to the board for review and approval. There were multiple options presented. The board did select out of the, the final four options, the board did select option number three, uh, which is this renovation expansion that we've been uh, working towards. Let me stop you right there. That was $10 million. Okay. That was with the number, with the with the presented a number that low. Well, where, where did we get 10 or what was, what's the original one or 17? 17 was presented back in 2021. Uh, as we've discussed um, a couple of times, the, the overall cost of construction that we've been seeing from then to now has increased between 35, 40%. As, as uh, uh, Ian mentioned in his introduction, we do feel like that number came from a cost consultant that we were working with at the time that provided that range. This was actually at the high end of the range that they provided to us that was presented by that group to the board. Uh, we felt it may have been low even at that time. Since that time, uh, to your point about the warehouse, the scope of that piece of the project has grown a little bit and that's added some additional cost. With the realization, this came about through the uh, COVID pandemic experience, that uh, there, there's two different pieces to this. The, the warehouse is, is one part of it for storage of goods. The distribution um, piece of it is a separate component, and it ties back to federal mandates or requirements to meet the guidelines, what they refer to as a localized uh, distribution site, an LDS. Uh, which has certain design guidelines that are that are uh, required to be in place in order to qualify for certain shipments and, and distribution to the area. Diana will, has mentioned, I think, before too, about how they were providing goods to the hospital to the Indian tribes and others along the way. So, um, in order to to enable them to to be in a position to be able to qualify for those grants, um, we included that as part of that concept. I feel it's unfair to David trying to describe all, all that. And when we say circulation, I just want to clarify, yes, I'd like potentially flow. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that we have a department that are split. And for people to go, we have had Tetris, the department, and those of you who have a toured it have, um, are aware of that, where we've outgrown, oh, outgrown, I'm used to projecting my voice, outgrown the space. And so we've separated things. And so when we say flow, we want to centralize it. So our clinical rooms, when we, when the building was built, were yeah, tiny, very small. We had to move them, very narrow space. Um, and there were some issues with the initial design, I think. Um, utilization, again, has gone on exponentially. So when we talk about that, we also talk about separating the, uh, the, um, employee work areas with the um, patient access areas. And again, a lot of what we do, because of the nature of what we do, we, we want to be able to ensure a certain degree of privacy. And we are that safety net. And people sometimes you know, are hesitant to approach our, our, our clinics. Or, and, and we know that treatment and prevention are the most critical things. And, and so we want to make sure that that's a positive experience for for the patient, and that's not talking about you know what kind of flooring we have or whatever, but it's just being able to allow them that privacy and be able to not have to crisscross or try to find you know another service within when they're you know for here come here, but then go down the office um, down to there. So again, I, I can't stand here and tell you um, about the yeah, numbers. That's not my field. Tested for AIDS, and then I have to go totally across the building to get a, a result. And walk through vital records and, yeah. and and do whatever. So again, I, these were design features to enhance either a safety aspect or a patient um, service area. So again, I can't speak to the numbers or why they look like that. We we were just and I'm still very grateful that we had the opportunity to present what those concerns were, have them validated by them, and 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 I understand. I, I understand the reason for, for the cuts, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna stand here and argue the justification. I, I do. My team and I go. Um, we we try, we try to seek as much outside federal grant funding whenever possible to to make sure we either implement the services or expand them at no cost. And 
I, like I said, we, we will continue to do that and we're resilient and we're really grateful that again, without having those satellite centers, the different municipalities, Somerton, San Luis, especially out in Dayton, they've been so generous with allotting us space. So it takes a lot of coordination and, and, it, and it takes um, a lot of work, but that's, that's our purpose, that's our mission, and um, we will continue to try to figure that out. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a question. Isn't your bus supposed to be your satellite? The, so that was for vaccination clinics. We were taking out five, six um, trucks. We can't do exams there. Uh, we, again, that's what happens when you have the cost-saving mindset. Again, all that stuff was really delayed. We picked a, a unit that we could get, and it allows for so for six basic screenings, but we couldn't, for example, do a you know a health assessment that required bathrooms or whatever. That, that It's not equipped by that. It was the most cost-effective option. It fit the need that for what we did, it, which was basic outreach and immunizations. We could get it as quick. It took, I think, two and a half years. That was as soon as we could get it. Fleet here in the county was instrumental in helping us um, procure that and get that. So again, we did the best we could at the best, you know, the best solution at that time. But no, we, we, we can't do that. But again, uh, grateful to the municipalities to, to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Yes. I'm going to excuse myself. I need to. Mr. Chairman, I will withdraw my motion. We've already, and you'll withdraw your second, we've already acted on the emergency management as an individual item. Um, and we postponed that too. What? We postponed We postponed it. Yeah, but we've acted on it as an individual item. And instead of acting on all of these, I propose that we approve the Yuma County administration so we proceed as we have approved at this point in time. And then secondly, because what we've heard today, for example, is that Mr. Engel did not have the opportunity to review some of this before we sat down. Heard the same thing from Cliff, heard the same thing from Diana. Mm -hmm. I would like to propose that we uh, look at some of our other facilities and uh, readdress how we approach, for example, this building in the future. I know that uh, Chairman Porches has in his mind another building that we might be able to look at for lease. Mm -hmm. um, but. Ultimately, we have to live within our means, and none of us here are willing to go back to the taxpayers and ask them to fund yeah. the additional $16 million over what we have already projected. And so I would like to address these individually, with, uh, Mr. Chairman. With the understanding, though, too, that what is presented here is the current budget, not one penny more will we accept. Yeah. We, we want to see it less, but I don't want to come back and see... Um, for, IT, 19,000 or 19 million. For example, and I realize, Diana, what you're trying to accomplish. However, how do we live within our means down at public health? When we remove U of A cooperative extension and have a place for them to go, then how can we reutilize that space? And maybe we have to address this uh, over. Yeah. I, I agree with about 95% about of what you said, but I want you to look at that chart and realize that in 2021, we had 69 million, well, $70 million worth of projects. The top project that went up is the, the one we can't do much with, which is the administrative building. It went up 20 million bucks mm -hmm. in one single step in two years. It went 20 million bucks. That, that made us already over the budget. We got, then we got the health department at 17, it went to 27. Then we had the U of A's from 2 million to 8 million. Then we had ITS from 11 million to 18 million. Every one of those projects went up ex ex except the emergency management one. When we look at the budget now, the current budget estimates, we're at $108 million. We do a balanced budget here. Either we cut the projects down or we uh, increase the, the, uh, the funding. There's no other way to look at this. Either we cut the projects down or increase them. Now, I understand that some of them are taking a bigger hit. I, I, the health department supposedly, uh, you know, and I do agree with you. I, I, but, but, but everybody's I, I, taking I say a cut. We approve the real the, the the budget, budget. realign budget, and then, and then we look at and then we look at things individual, individual, individual see how we can cover those. Yeah, perfect. That, that okay, so on. Mr. Chairman, what's the motion? Okay, my motion would be that we approve the realign budget to get us back to budget and that we look at every one of those individuals, specifically the U of A extension, to see how we come up with the additional funding that we need to make that whole. That's, that's the only one that I think needs to look at, be looked at because I think that we reduce the budget so much that it may not be practical to do it. That's the only one. The other ones I think everybody understands that this is about chair sacrifice. But chair sacrifice doesn't mean doing something that isn't going to work. 
So my motion is to approve the realigned budget and come back individually with just one project and see how we can make it work. Uh, that would be the U of A sanction. The other ones, I think, I think the help, I think the other ones are employees of the county. And the county sort of makes that decision, and we make the decision, and they have to live with it. I mean, they may not be happy about it, but they have to live with it. The U of A is, a thing, I think, a different, a different story. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. To, we do yeah, have to, a responsibility. To figure out a way to pay for that $8 million project. When without we burdening. Money, yeah, without burdening the, the taxpayers any longer. But we can find the money either. Mr. Chairman, do you second that? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right. Okay, you got it. Continue with the prices at that level, and we'll we'll look at the U of A expansion to see what we can do about that one. Okay, because that does not take us time anyway to secure Thank the, you. the site. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, patience. We'll now move on to item five, county administration. I think that we had uh, we had the, the report from Alejandro who's not here. Mr. Figueroa is out today, okay. so there's no legislative update. I think discussion. we got one more. We have no discussion. We got one more. We don't have the uh, oh, office of management and budget. budget. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. You didn't realize. You I don't know if Gil could live with himself or sleep at night. The historical. You gotta. You gotta give us a. Okay, go ahead. Do the historical one. I have a quick. Uh, PowerPoint should go quick. It's, oh no, death by PowerPoint. Famous last word. <laughs> um, we're gonna do the second quarter budget, budget update in. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. We just have to Let's pull back. I just need to find a couple million dollars. Okay. All right. So we can make it work. I just. There were. Not a penny. Oh. Okay. Death by PowerPoint. Difficulties. Not PowerPoint. It's a PDF. So. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll be going over general fund revenues and expenditures, both historical data, uh, actual versus budget, and for the revenue specifically, I'll do uh, an overview of the Joint Legislative Budget Committee forecast and provide uh, sales tax graphs information. So moving right into the second quarter historical uh, for revenue, we can see that our largest revenue sources are going to be <coughs> property tax and state shared. Uh, a county sales tax. We do have a slight increase from prior uh, year of $240,000 and um, state share sales tax increased uh, from prior uh, second quarter by 4.69. So we're still seeing an increase there and we are also seeing an increase in county sales tax of 4.23. Um, Next, we have the general fund revenue table, and we have uh, the, our revenues listed by category. We have the budget, and we have our actuals, and we show how we're doing um, over benchmark. I'll focus on the uh, items outlined in green, which is the state shared sales tax, and historically, we've collected 48.8%. Uh, for second quarter, right now, we're at 49.9%. So that's slightly above benchmark. That's a favorable position to be in. Uh, for county sales tax, we historically ha have collected 48.6% for second quarter. We're currently at 50.1%, uh, again, also favorable. For licenses and permits, uh, we're at actually at 79.2% uh, collection of budget. And in uh, touching base with development services, they've seen an uptick in valuations and also uh, the number of permits. For internal intergovernmental, uh, we are at above what we budgeted already. We received the, uh, the Altex refund for that, so that's why we're uh, above budget. Um, we also have two pending state reimbursements that we normally would have received by second quarter that we have not received, so that's not reflective on here. So and what what are those? Um, for the state lottery, we get five hundred fifty thousand, and then the elected uh, officials uh, relief, elected official retirement relief for two hundred fifty thousand. Um, so overall, for total revenue, we're above benchmark. We can see that we've collected 52.1%, um, and we're doing good so far for second quarter. Um, I'll go over the... Uh, one, one, one second. You don't have to stay here. This is kind of like the nuts and bolts of this process. So if unless you, you want to be, be, unless you you want to be but if you don't want to be... I'm all in. <laughs> 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 well, I 
just wanted to let you know you didn't have to stay for this. this is kind of, uh, thank you very much. You thank you for the moral support. Yes. And this is kind of the nuts and bolts of stuff. And most people don't like to get this deep into the weeds, but we, we do. So. so our office monitors uh, the JLBC forecast um, to see how the state is projecting uh, their sales tax. In October, they were projecting a 2.1% uh, increase over prior year. They have revised those uh, projections to 2.5 for fiscal year 23-24. Um, both our county sales tax and our state, state share sales tax are above the 2.5%. We'll dive in into uh, the state share sales tax just uh, to see how we're doing. We are above uh, Prior year, we can see prior year here in the maroon kind of color. Um, we are this this 23-24. We're right um, above, like right here, and then this beige color kind of is what budget how we are doing uh, against budget. So we're pretty good uh, there. We're almost at the top, huh? Yes. So budget is this, and we're pretty aligned with what we budgeted for. So we receiving we're collecting what we budgeted so far. Um, as we go into county sales tax, we kind of have the same scenario. We are above uh, prior year, and then we are um, right uh, at budget as, as well, slightly above budget. The biggest uh, I, uh, categories within our county sales tax that see the increases are in retail. Uh, we see here that we have we are above um, prior year's budget. And that reflects uh, a 2.7% or 124,000 increase from prior year. The next one is our remote sales. These um, have continuously increased since that their inception in 2019-20. Uh, um, so we are also are continuing to see this increase. Our next slide just combines the retail and remote sales. And we can see that they continue to increase from prior year. Um, retail uh, is a good indicator of how the county sales tax are doing so that we see the increase and so that's the county sales tax are doing good in the county. Uh, this last uh, revenue slide, it just shows the um, county sales tax over the prior uh, by year and category and we can see that we continue to see the, the increase uh, from year to year. Most of them are just about Fail. Yeah, you, if you Fail. focus on the total over here, we can see the increase from prior year. Yeah, but retail's a little higher, but the rest are pretty much um, on par. On par, yeah. So we'll, par average, yeah. yeah, we'll see retail and then remote. Mm -hmm. Remote and retail. Moving into the general fund expenditures, we have the historical uh, graph right here. And um, we are... 7.7% increase over prior year, and this is uh, the personnel we could, category we can see as the driver of the increase. This is anticipated with the uh, scale adjustment and the anniversary increase included for, uh, this year in the budget and new FTEs that were added, um, as well as prior year, we had two mid-year adjustments for personnel for the county attorney's market and the sheriff's office shift, shift differential and specialty pay. So are you able to tell us, going back to the last slide, with the proposed market adjustments in salaries? So we do not have that data. Um, we, we are hopeful that we have that for the uh, Board of Supervisors retreat next week. Um, uh, Tony will be presenting on the economic outlook and Gil will be presenting on the mid-year review um, to have those numbers. Let me, let me say that whatever we're doing, the staff is more concerned with their salary increases. Whatever market, that's the problem with ordering a market survey. It creates expectation. And the expectation is that we will apply that. So we're now moving into March. Uh, I know we're waiting for the county court system to give us theirs and all this other stuff, but I, I tell you what, I, I think that it, it, it's going to be so anticlimactic if we don't do something relatively soon on that, that by the time we do it, people are not going to be happy no matter what we do. So I'd say that we need to put that on the next on the next agenda so we can make a decision when this is going to be applied. Mr. Go ahead. Uh, 
I thought it was going to be a Would you, like, you, you can speak to that. that. Will, it's planned to be on the agenda for March 4th for potential adoption. And when will it be implemented? There's no going into that. Let's move on because to determine when you want to implement it. You and this is helping us you because start. when you put it all together, it's where the money is going to come from. It's going to come from this. I right. Okay. It's up to the board. So Ian will have an opportunity to sit down with Judge Hawes this week so that we can we sure that that can work. come together. Yeah, look forward to it. <laughs> well, I'd be with you if I could, but <laughs> I can't. Going over the general fund uh, expenditures for the second quarter, um, we're a little bit below uh, benchmark in personnel. We do have, uh, that's contributed to the vacancies. We do see the vacancies going down from prior year. We have 98 vacancies last year, and this year we only have 62, and that's uh, thank you to the Board of Supervisors for prioritizing recruitment and retention. Um, for uh, supplies and services, we see that we are a little bit above benchmark, and that's due to uh, items from prior year being expensed in current fiscal year due to supply chain issues. Um, those, that was pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, I'm available. Go right back to supply. Ex say that again. So for supplies and services, we're a little bit above mm -hmm. uh, uh, what we should be. We've spent a little bit above our budget, and that's due to having some items from prior year being expensed in this fiscal year. Because they didn't come in during this, this calendar year, they were bought. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and that's oh. Thank you for the presentation. And nobody died. <laughs> I don't want to ask you questions about site bid titles, but whatever that is. But it's the county transportation system. Uh, in light of a rigorous meeting today, are we okay to bypass current events? Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> this meeting's adjourned.